Happy Monday, everyone, and welcome to Testa and Neil Keep It Real right here on WWSU 106.9 and our YouTube channel. I'm Shane Neal alongside with me, Parker Testa. Parker, I'm live in Florida. This is a little weird, but we're making it work. How are you? I'm good, man. You know, I told you it was okay to take the week off, but you you need, you get, you just seem to, you know, you just never want to quit working, and I respect it. Nope, grind don't stop. My my thought process is I'm going to work my I'm going to work my tail off in my 20s uh because I'm going to want to kill myself if I do that in my 30s. So, hopefully I do enough work in my 20s where I can kind of take a step back in my 30s. That's the plan. Work hard early so you can relax later. I like it. Yes, absolutely. But hey, this vacation was meant to be a vacation. I'm actually going golfing tomorrow and I'm very excited. I'm not good at it, but I'm excited. Out a boy. When I get back in town, we're going to go golfing. Absolutely. I'm there. We got a big show for you today. Uh, a lot to talk about. Penny Hardaway, the favorite for an NBA head coaching job. Who saw that coming? I sure didn't. Um, so we're going to open up with that a little bit later on in hour number one, uh, regrading the biggest moves from the MLB offseason. Uh, I'm excited to kind of look back at some of the biggest trades, some of the biggest free agent signings, and see how they've kind of played out about halfway through the season. Hour number two, uh, the, David DeCastro, a little bit surprising news. He was cut by the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, okay. we, have four te- we have four teams that uh, are very likely potential spots for him to end up, um, and we'll go over those and kind of the update on DeCastro. And then our tier list today, NBA head coaches. Since we're talking about Penny Hardaway maybe making the shift to the NBA, we thought it would be fun to do a tier list of all the NBA head coaches. So we're excited Hope you're just as excited, but two hours of sports content to kick off your week. I'm very, very excited to get going. I am too. You know, um, I give you major props for still wanting to do the show this week, but I'm excited you wanted to stick with it. We got a lot to get into this week. Um, you know, we've got NBA conference finals, um, and have some NFL talk, and of, of course, some uh, we'll sprinkle in some baseball because we're you know we're both baseball junkies. So I'm looking forward to it. Yes, yes, absolutely. No doubt about it. So let's get right into it here today um, with the NBA. Penny Hardaway, uh, this came out of nowhere. Uh, I, I thought Penny Hardaway was pretty locked at Memphis, uh, but uh, this came out a little bit earlier today. Penny Hardaway, a serious candidate for the Magic head coaching job after an interview earlier this week. Tyler Conway announced that on Bleacher Report. Uh, But like I said, Memphis men's basketball coach Penny Hardaway has reportedly emerged as a serious contender in the Orlando Magic search for a new head coach. Yeah, this one's interesting to me. You know, um, they they parted ways with Steve Clifford, uh, which I think was, you know, no one, everyone saw it coming. Um, But they, uh, you know, Hardaway is is worshipped like a god in Memphis. Um, so it it would you know it, it'd be surprising to see him leave. I you know I you know I like like I said he's highly regarded at Memphis, um, and actually he was a key factor in in, in Katrina Merriweather getting the job there as in, in uh, you know as the women's coach in Memphis. So um, like you said, um, he's he's a you know great coach. Um, it'd be surprising to see mm-hmm. him leave Memphis, but you know I'm you know if he gets this job, I'm really excited to see what Penny does at the you know at the pro level. Yeah, I agree. I think that uh, it's definitely something that came out of nowhere. Like I said, uh, Penny Hardaway has been at Memphis for three seasons. Uh, he's put up a 63 and 32 record. Uh, Memphis has not made the NCAA tournament under Hardaway. They were going to make it in 2020, I think, um, before the pandemic. Uh, they had James Wiseman, obviously. He's had really good recruiting classes in his time at Memphis, but he also won the 2021 NIT championship. So, Memphis kind of tra- trending up under Penny Hardaway, but uh, I mean, uh, it seems kind of strange that a guy would want to leave his alma mater after three years with the team kind of moving forward in the right direction. But I mean, the magic, the golden era of magic basketball was in that mid nineties with Shaq and Penny Hardaway. Um, one of my favorite 30 for thirties of all time is this magic moment about Shaq and Penny playing together in Orlando and really putting the magic on the map. Um, a team with, you know, a 20 year old Shaquille O'Neal and a 21 year old Penny Hardaway was giving Michael Jordan in his prime, everything he could handle. And that wasn't supposed to happen. So 
the best era of the Magic came when Penny Hardaway was a part of that organization. And if they want to get back to another golden era of Magic basketball, maybe it's with Penny Hardaway back in the organization, this time as the head coach. Yeah, it's and uh, it, it, like you said, um, you know, he's, he's highly regarded in, uh, in Orlando as well after playing there, uh, you know, for, for five or six seasons or whatever it was. But um, like you said, golden era of magic basketball was, was with Pen- was when Penny was there. So um, he has Orlando ties. I think that's why he's a significant, you know, favorite for this job. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see what the magic ultimately decide. It sure will. Um, if you're just joining us again, Penny Hardaway, a serious contender for the Orlando Magic head coaching job. Um, it's uh, Hardaway has college coaching experience. Like I said, the ability to cultivate relationships with young players uh, that would make him a very solid candidate for the rebuilding Magic. Uh, it's unclear if Hardaway is a tactical mastermind, but he's been an excellent relationship builder at the college level in recruiting and developing. And if you're going to be, you know, a young NBA head coach of a rebuilding team, a lot of these guys that you're going to get in the draft are still 19, 20 years old. So it's basically still like maintaining relationships with college age kids. So this could be a, a dream job for Penny Hardaway back in Orlando. Um, Penny did say earlier this month when he was asked if he was interested in coaching the Magic, he said, I'm flattered by it because people are even mentioning my name, obviously, because of my, the relationship I've had with the Magic over the years. It's weird because the timing on it is I'm just now starting to get into my own as Memphis head coach and understand everything that comes along with this. And then all of a sudden, the Magic job and the people start talking about the Magic job. So it's weird, but my heart is in Memphis. I don't know what happens in the future. If I did coach in the NBA, that would be the place I would want to coach. Yeah. So like you, like you said, and like he said, um, there, there are there are multiple guys that you know that they they don't think about coaching the NBA until you know they have that one team. You know, every, everybody has you know a destination that if the job comes open and they're you know they're they're a candidate for the job, they will easily go for it because you know you know they're you know as guys say that they're not interested in, in being a coach in the NBA uh, or in any professional league. But if there's that one team that calls. They, they they they'll listen. They'll pick up the phone. So right. um, it, it's something that I think that was surprising. With you know, similar to what Urban Meyer did, a lot of people thought he wouldn't come back to coaching. But you know, I guess Jacksonville was that place where Urban saw a lot of potential. And I think Penny feels the same way. You know, obviously he has Orlando ties, and uh, like he said, that's the one team I'd want to coach. So like he said, we'll see. Yeah, and I think I mean a lot of. I don't. I mean, I think a lot of people know this, but coaching is a lot like you know just athletics in general it's a business i mean you can talk about uh, a high school coach that's been at the same school for 20 years and you know has a ton of success and says he's never going to leave because he loves it there it's home but if a college like texas a&m or florida or something calls that high school coach and offers him a job he's leaving in a heartbeat he does not give one crap about that high school job because it's a business and you try to work your way up the ranks. And I think that's what's happening here with Penny Hardaway. Does he love Memphis? Absolutely. It's his alma mater. Uh, It was his first, you know, real coaching experience. He's done a really nice job. He's built some really good relationships with players like James Wiseman, some really talented coaches there at Memphis, but it's a business. And if the Orlando magic offer him the job to be an NBA head coach uh, and take over a team that's, you know, starting to trend in a new era of basketball and be at the top of the coaching tree in the NBA. I don't know if Penny can turn that down. I think, I mean, I think it's a step up on the ladder. I mean, as much as Memphis head coaches are a really cool job, Orlando magic head coach might be a cooler job. Yeah, it's possible. And, uh, uh, you know, like, like you said, um, that you know, who who would who would turn down the chance to coach in the NBA? Um, and, you know, it's the best of the best in the world. Um, and, you know, even though the Magic are in, in a bit of a re- rebuilding phase, you're still coaching at the pro level. You know, mm-hmm. and you know you can't beat that. That's you know that's the top of the top. So, um, Pen- Penny, like like you said, is you know is a perfect candidate. Um, and uh, I think this is very similar to the Memphis job. You know, you know, a lot of people thought that Penny wasn't interested in coaching, but Memphis came calling, you know, and he's done a fantastic job at Memphis. You know, he, he won the 2021 NIT. So um, maybe maybe we'll see him kind of uh, like this says, you know, maybe this is the perfect guy to uh, um, to kind of go through this rebuild with the Orlando Magic. Right. Um, you know, the Magic are going to grow, grow with young players. And maybe Penny will want to grow with them. So we'll see what they ultimately decide to do. 
Exactly. I'm glad you brought that up because I, I wanted to kind of reiterate that point that I think, I mean, nobody wants to coach a bad basketball team. Nobody wants to be the coach of a bad team, period. But Penny Hardaway might be the perfect, perfect coach for a team that's rebuilding and a team that's on the rise. Because not only, like you said, would he grow with the young talent in the Magic and they kind of get better together, they'd learn together, they'd grow together at the NBA ranks. But his biggest strength at Memphis, he's not the best X's and O's guys. There's better guys out there with X's and O's. That's, I mean, that's a fact. He's still learning. He's only been a college coach for three years. But he had top-tier recruiting classes And he had guys that would go to war for him at the University of Memphis. And that says one thing to me, and that says that he is absolutely top tier at building relationships with young players. And if you're going to be the coach of a rebuilding team, there's going to be a lot of 19, 20, 21 year old kids on that roster. And they're going to need somebody to believe in. They're going to need somebody to buy into to start off their NBA career. I think Penny is the perfect guy for that. Yeah, I think so too. You know, it's a lot like the Dan Campbell situation in Detroit with the Lions. Um, personally, I didn't see, you know, he, I know he's had interim jobs in, in the past, um, but after seeing, you know, the interviews he's done in his opening press conference, personally, I'm not a Lions fan. I am, have never, you know, I, you know, I barely played football. I, you know, I didn't play football, um, but I'd run through a wall for Dan Campbell and I don't even know the guy. I mean, I just, you know, from what I've seen, he just seems like a heck of a dude. So um, and it seems like Penny has the same situation in Memphis. So, um, if, if he if he has that kind of you know that kind of pull in Memphis, and you know to where the players love him, the athletic department loves him, um, it's it's quite possible that you know um, he'll, he'll be like you said he'll be coaching similar ages to uh, you know it's a young team, uh, and they're just going to get even younger with you know guys the guys love bringing in through the draft. So, um, maybe we'll see a similar situation with or with it with the magic where if Penny gets this job, the players will love playing for him. Um, you know, the, the front office will love having him around, hopefully. Uh, I think he, I think they will. Um, but we'll, we'll see what you know what, what Penny decides on. We'll see what the Orlando Magic decide on. I think Penny's a great candidate for this job. He, we wouldn't be talking about him otherwise. Um, so, um, yeah, it, it's quite possible that he's he's uh you know he he'll be a great guy for the job and I and I think he'll do a fantastic job, mm-hmm. uh, given the right roster and the right situation. Um, so uh, I'm excited to see what the Magic decide to do, and if Penny gets the job, I'm excited to see what he does. Yeah, I am too. I think that um, if he was able to accomplish in three seasons what he was able to accomplish at Memphis, two top twenty recruiting classes. An NIT championship, the number two overall pick in James Wiseman. Um, he accomplished so much in such a short period of time. If you give him four or five seasons at the helm of the Orlando Magic, I think he takes them from bottom three team in the NBA to a top five team in the East. I think he's just that kind of guy. He's not, like I said, he's not the best X's and O's coach there that you'll find. He's far from it. Um, but if he finds a group of 20, 21 year old kids that buy into him and they grow together for two or three seasons, we might be looking at the next Atlanta Hawks or Phoenix Suns in Orlando. Yeah, it's possible. You know, we've we've seen what you know. Nate, Nate McMillan is not a you know a younger head coach. He's he's been a head coach many times, uh, but you know he's he's done ter- terrific things with a great roster. Uh, Monty Williams is the perfect example. You know, he he's he's grown with that team, um, and he's he's brought in guys like Chris Paul to help with the veteran leadership. And, 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 you know, we talked about this before the show, even if Chris Ball doesn't stick around, they still have, you know, great players, guys like Payne, guys like Booker, guys like, you know, uh, Aiton, you know, so you go down the list of guys who are on that Phoenix team that are, you know, still very successful, even if Chris Paul wasn't around. So, um, you know, veteran leadership matters wholeheartedly, but um, if, if you have a good group and a great coach and, and, you know, players that like playing for that coach, you really don't need a whole lot of veteran leadership because it's, it's you know, you, you form a very tight knit group. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Parker. Well, we're going to end this off with, you know, just kind of a little bit of speculation. It's Monday, uh, June 28th uh, at the time at, at right now uh, by Friday, which will be July 2nd. Is Penny Hardaway the coach of the Orlando Magic? I don't think so. I think they're going to drag this out. Okay. Um, uh, I think, you know, they, they, you know, there's been a lot of speculation and, yeah, you know, there's still a few teams that have coaching slots that need to be filled teams like Washington, um, as well as new Orleans. So, 
Uh, the, the guys are going to do their due diligence. I, I think I think Orlando is going to wait and see what these other teams do. Um, you know, there there's still plenty of quality candidates out there. People like Becky Hammond, um, and, and you know, there there's other assistants around around the league that are you know being looked at as as you know um, favorites for some of these jobs. You know, and some of them yeah. are already gone. You know. Um, Udoka and in, uh, in what got the job in Boston. Chauncey Billups got the job in Portland. So um, there's still teams that are looking for that for that right. team, for that right. coach that right coach for their right fit. Um, but um, there's still plenty of quality candidates, and Penny's one of them. Right, and I think that I mean Orlando and for both Orlando and Penny, there's not a rush because I think that uh, with Washington and with New Orleans, they could still be looking at multiple candidates like Becky Hammond, like. Um, you know, maybe they reach down to the college ranks. I'm still not entirely sold. I don't. I don't think it's this year, but I'm not entirely sold that John Calipari doesn't come back to the NBA. Um, I don't. So I think there's still multiple options on the table for teams like Washington and New Orleans. Um, but I think Orlando and Penny Hardaway are kind of tied to each other. I don't think Penny would go anywhere but Orlando, and I think Orlando is kind of locked on Penny Hardaway right now. So I don't think they feel the rush of getting a deal done because I think they know they're kind of married to each other. And if everything kind of works out in the end, I think this will be a match that ends up happening. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, like you said, this has to be, you know, everything's got to, you know, fire on all cylinders for both the magic and for Penny. Um, so the, you know, both these, you know, both these, you know, parties are, you know, very great at what they do. You know, the magic are obviously talented, um, because they're an NBA franchise and they've had talent before, and, you know, and Penny's had great success at Memphis. So, you know, like you said, it's got to be a perfect fit. They got to have, you know, they got to uh, be on the same page regarding, you know, anything and everything. You know, you know, the contract terms have got to work out. Uh, Penny's, you know, Penny has obviously showed interest in this in this job, uh, but we'll see if it's mutual with the Magic. Yeah, we will. Uh, Parker, I just realized that we're doing the show YouTube only this week because I'm in Florida and I don't have time to get the show on normal WWSU, but I realized that makes things easier for us because, um, I don't have to worry about commercial breaks. And also if we, for some reason, get a segment done earlier than normal or later than normal, we don't have to worry about the time of the show. Right. So if we get this, cheer- if for some reason we get this tier list done today and it's only, you know, been an hour and 40 minutes, we don't have to drag things out for 20 more minutes. We're good to go. Yes, we are. You know, it makes our life a whole lot easier. It sure does. All right, so let's move on to, I'm excited about this article, Parker. You were kind of reading through some of them earlier, uh, but, you know, we had a lot of big moves this this MLB offseason. George Springer to the Toronto Blue Jays. Um, Francisco Lindor traded to the New York Mets. Uh, Blake Snell traded to the San Diego Padres. A lot of big stars moving teams, moving to different cities. Uh, and now almost halfway through the season, uh, Bleacher Report went back and regraded some of the offseason moves. So let's start breaking this down. Uh, and let's start off with, uh, you know, one of the first moves of the offseason, the Chicago White Sox acquiring Lance Lynn back on December 8th. Um, Lance Lynn um, has, in so far in 13 games this year, a 2.14 ERA with 86 strikeouts in 75 innings. Uh, he's been really, really good. He's always been a dependable eating eater. Uh, but he's had one of his best seasons of his career um, in Chicago this season so far. Uh, he's right up there with teammates Carlos Rodon and Lucas Giolito uh, in Chicago. They've had a really good three-headed monster. Um, the White Sox are seven and four this season when he pitches at least five innings. Um, so even though they had to give up a promising young pitcher in Dane Dunning to get Lance Lynn, uh, he's you know been one of the top pitchers in the American League, and he has them in first place. So. I'm 100% on board with this grade of an A. I think Lance Lynn to Chicago was a great move. It's paid off for Lance Lynn, and it's really paid off for the White Sox. Yeah, it has. You know, um, you know, as you know, as much criticism and um, you know controversy as Tony Larusa gets, Lance Lynn has been fantastic. There's no doubt about it. Like he he started 13 games. Um, I'm not quite sure what his record is. Um, I but, think he's like nine uh, and three or something like that. Yeah, I'm not positive, but. Right. Um, yeah. So he's, you know, he's like, like you said, 75 innings pitch, 55 hits, eight homers allowed, 86 strikeouts, which is fantastic. And only allowing an ERA of just over two. So, um, you know, he's been fantastic for, for, for the White Sox. 
And, you know, and, and on the flip side of it, you know, the Rangers got Dane Dunning and Avery Weems, both, uh, both, you know, um, you know, pitchers. So, um, both these guys are, they, 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 they they've been okay. Um, Weems is, you know, he's, he's a prospect, um, um, and high a ball. So, you know, um, he's, he's still got a ways to go. It does Weems, but, um, Dane Dunning has, you know, he's, he's been pretty good. You know, he's, he's pitched, um, you know, he's not a big, he's not a big innings guy, only goes four or five innings per, you know, when, when he does pitch. Um, but you know, he's, he, he needs to change up his, his, his pitching approach. Like this says, he, he has a pretty solid change up, but, um, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to, you know, get him, you know, worked into the lineup a little bit is Chris Woodward. So, um, you know, this has worked out great for, for the White Sox. Lance Lynn has been, you know, almost unbelievable this year, but, um, you know, this, this has been, a, you know, a solid trade for both teams, even, even though Weems is, you know, a, a prospect that's still coming up through the minors. Um, but yeah, Lance Lynn has been no doubt fantastic. I think you're muted. My bad. I did mute my mic, um, but uh, I'm not going to lie to you. I know the Red Sox have been really, really good this year. I know that the Yankees still have all the talent in the world. I know that the Rays have had moments of brilliance. I know that the Astros have been really, really, really good this year. Carlos Correa is having a career year. Um, Jordan Alvarez looks like a future MVP. Uh, but if I had to, on June 28th, if I had to pick the team that I think represents the American League in the World Series, I'm going with the Chicago White Sox. I like the three-headed monster. If they get to the playoffs and you want to knock this team out in a series, you have to go up against Giolito, Keuchel, Lynn, and um, Cease. Or am I forgetting somebody? Giolito, oh, I'm sorry, Rodon. They'll move Cease to the bullpen. Giolito, Keuchel, Lynn and Rodon. That's hard enough as it is. And then you have Tim Anderson, Jose Abreu, uh, Nick Madrigal will be back and healthy. Eloy Jimenez will be back and healthy. Luis Robert will be back and healthy. Yasmani Grandal, Yoan Mancada. This might be the most talented team in baseball. It's definitely, I think, the most talented team in the American League when they're healthy. And I think as long as, you know, one of those big pitchers doesn't get hurt and everybody in their batting order comes back when they're supposed to come back. I think the White Sox get to the fall classic this year. They're just so good. Yeah, yeah, they are. And um and this is, you know, you know, the White Sox were great. I thought the White Sox were great last year with, you know, with, you know, the, they've obviously added Tony LaRusso as their manager and they uh, parted ways with uh, Rick Renteria, but um, you know, they they've gone through a lot of change in the off season, but they still have that same core group and uh, you know, in Giolito and in Anderson and Madrigal and uh, as well as Grandal and Yermin Mercedes has been, you know, great this year as well. So they have a great group. Um, you know, I, you know, I'm not sure what their bullpen looks like, but, you know, I, I, and your bullpen matters to a certain extent. But if your starters can go six and seven and eight innings, you know, you don't need to worry about your bullpen a whole lot. Yeah, right. And I'm with you. I don't I'm not a hundred. I think the their bullpen's probably the weakest part of their team. But I do know that if they get to the postseason, they'd move Cease to the bullpen and Cease has electric stuff. There's 99 with a wipeout curveball, wipeout changeup. He's really, really good. Uh, and then you also have two of the best back end relievers in baseball. Aaron Bummer, who might be one of the top underrated lefty relievers in baseball. He's like a poor man's Chapman. He throws a 97 mile an hour sinker, wipeout slider, and also can throw a 97 mile an hour fastball. And then you have maybe the best reliever in baseball who they signed this offseason, Liam Hendricks. So the bullpen might be the most lack of depth part of their roster, but it still has a lot of really good pieces. And I think, like I said, as long as they stay healthy, which is always the biggest question about every team, I don't, I can't think of a team right now that could beat Chicago in a playoff series. No, it's tough. Um, you know, Boston looks really good right now. You know, they swept the Yankees this weekend. Uh, which, you know, I said this before the show, made my heart so happy. Um, mm -hmm. But we, uh, you know, um, Boston looks really good. And, uh, you know, they're going to they give, they're, they're going to give, you know, the White Sox a tough test, I think. Um, but, you know, there, there's also these teams like, like the White Sox. There's teams like the Rays who are looking great as well. The Astros uh, look know, great as well. Right, right. And, you know, lo lots of these American League teams don't, you know, you never count out Bob Melvin led teams. The Athletics no, look no. great also. So, um there's lots of, you know, I'm, you know, and I'm can quite honestly say most of these teams have surprised me. There are teams that have, you know, um, I expected not to be great um, and they've been fantastic teams like, you know, 
um, Boston. I didn't expect mm-hmm. Boston to be great. Um, you know, yeah. I, I didn't even know who the hell Bobby Dahlbeck was before this year. <laughs> but, um, you know, he's been great. You know, as well as, you know, I, I didn't know how Cora would pan out, um, you know, coming back to a, you know, a very different roster than he had um, two years ago. But, you know, he's, they, they've done a great job. So, um, you know, even though the Yankees have struggled a bit, I'm never counting out the Yankees because they're, you know, they have, you know, right. great teams um, as always. Um, yeah. And the Astros, just kind of piggybacking off of that, the Astros are a team that I think both of us thought would be closer to average than one of the best teams in the league this year. I kind of thought that uh, their pitching depth wasn't there like it was in years past. And, um, you know, guys like Correa and Brantley and um, Guriel are kind of a little more injury history than some other guys in the league. And they just lost George Springer, but they haven't missed a freaking beat, man. And Dusty Baker should be in contention for manager of the year right now because the Astros look fantastic. They do. And uh, I'm a big, I'm a big uh, Dusty Baker fan. I know you as are, you are as well. He's a winner everywhere he goes. Right. And, um, you know, as much as it pains me to say it, the Astros they look great. You know, you know, they got you know, Granky. And uh, as well as, like you said, Correa, Bregman, um, as well as a few other pieces there. So um, the Astros look great. Um, they're, they're, there's a few ALS teams that look great, the A's, the Astros. Um, and, I'm, and you know, their pitching has been atrocious this year, but I am not counting out the Los Angeles Angels. I'm not. No, uh, yeah. we, w- with, with, you know, how great they are, they still have ha- more than half the season to go, um, you know, even though we're, we're coming up on the All-Star break here shortly. But um, the, these teams are still looking, you know, there's plenty of teams that can make a run late. There's always a team that gets hot as you get into August and September. Um, mm-hmm. So, and they always, you know, they always surprise everybody, you know, going in. Um, and I'm not counting out the Chicago Cubs because David Ross is playing small ball. And I'm a big fan of small ball. Um, and I'm, I'm uh, I love what David Ross is doing in Chicago. So uh, there's, you know, there's going to be teams that come out of the woodworks that we don't expect. And we'll be talking about them here as we get towards the end of the summer, because uh, like I said, there's always a team that, you know, comes, uh, gets hot late and uh, a team you didn't expect. So, there's still plenty of baseball to be played. And, you know, it, yeah. it's certainly nowhere near over. No, um, but there, there's certainly you know the you know the the top you know the front runners for for playoff races, and the White Sox certainly are one of them. Two things, and then I, I promise we'll move on to the next one. But you mentioned Boston as a threat to the White Sox. I think, I mean, I'm a Reds fan, but I think the Red Sox are my favorite American League team. I like watching them. I like watching them succeed. Uh, but the biggest thing with the Red Sox, their bullpen's been solid this year. Obviously, Bogarts, Ben Intendi, or not Ben Intendi, I'm sorry, Bogarts, JD Martinez, Verdugo, Devers, playing like all stars. Um, but the biggest thing for the Red Sox is their starting pitching. Can Eduardo Rodriguez get back to the way he was two years ago? He had a really good start today against the Yankees. Hopefully, that's a step forward. And the big question that every Red Sox fan doesn't know, every baseball fan doesn't know, how the hell is Chris Sale going to look when he comes back next month? He's pitching in rehab games. He sounds like he looks really good. But until he's back on the mound in Fenway, uh, nobody knows. And if Chris Sale is the Chris Sale of pre-Tommy John, the Red Sox are going to be right there fighting for a World Series. But if Chris Sale doesn't come back the same, it might be the difference between them losing in the ALDS and you know getting to the Fall Classic. Right. And... um you know, we, we've seen it time and time again. Guys come back after Tommy John, and they're not the same. Um, and, you know, and, and, I, and I think a lot of guys um, are worried about, you know, having to have that surgery again because there are guys that have had that had surgery more than a few times because they um, blow out their arms, or you know, early and early on in their career, especially guys, you know, in high school and even in middle school now. They're throwing harder than they ever have before, and that just causes you to blow your arm out quicker and your elbow out quicker. So, um, you know, guys have, you know, they, 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 you know, they end their careers before they make the majors. So, um, yeah, so, you know, we'll see if sales the same Erod played great today, like you said, but, uh, we'll see how sale comes back. Um, their starting pitching is certainly the weak spot on that Boston roster. Um, but you know, they, they, they need to iron that out. Yeah, they sure do. All right, let's move on to the second one here. Um, like you said, Dunning's been pretty solid this year. I mean, ignore the four, six, three ERA, um, on the season, uh, in Texas, but in 15 games started, he does uh, have 75 strikeouts and 70 innings and only 25 walks. So the stuff is there for Dane Dunning and he has a, a bright future in Texas, but let's get on to, uh, 
this trade here at the end of the new year, at the end of 2020, I should say, where the San Diego Padres acquired Blake Snell from the Tampa Bay Rays. Snell so far this season, 15 games, 66 innings. He's given up 10 home runs, but he has 90 strikeouts, a little bit lack of control, 40 walks and a 5.29 ERA. Uh, in that trade, the Rays got Mejia, Patino, Wilcox, and Hunt, all prospects. But on the year, Patino has a 3-6 ERA and AAA. He looks like he could be making his debut very soon for the Rays. And even Mejia hitting 240 uh, and has been pretty solid as a Rays you know, depth catcher. So uh, I think the Rays did okay in this deal, getting some value back. Uh, I'm okay with the solid B rating for the Rays. Um, they gave the uh, Padres side a D which I know Snell hasn't been great in San Diego so far, but just the stuff that you get from Blake Snell, I feel like it's like a switch with him. I feel like he could turn it on any time, and just having that threat on the mound that is Blake Snell, I think warrants at least a C plus, maybe even like a B minus. Like I know the numbers aren't there, uh, but as the season goes on, you still have Blake Snell taking the mound every five days, and I don't care what his ERA is. That's intimidating. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, like you said, Blake Snell, his numbers haven't been what we what we're used to seeing from Blake Snell, but he's still Blake Snell. I mean, there's no doubt that he's, you know, one of the he's one of Cy Young. Best. Right. He's there's still no doubt that he's one of the game's best when he's on. And, you know, he has the stuff to be very good. You know, just the numbers haven't been been the same this year for Blake Snell. Um his you know, his uh control, like you said, has been rough. And that's um and that's a problem, you know. His fastball hasn't been as effective this year that we've that we've seen from you know Snell and you know of you know the Blake Snell that we're used to seeing. So um, it, it's certainly possible that he's you know he's struggled a bit. And he has, um, but um, he's still Blake Snell, and he'll he'll find his groove eventually. He's just you know working out the kinks right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Rays side of the deal getting Patino and Mejia? Obviously, we've only seen Mejia at the MLB level, but. Mejia, a switch hitting catcher, uh, not the greatest defender, but I still think he has a lot of untapped potential on the hitting side. Obviously, this is a guy that was the former top catching prospect in baseball. Uh, he was in that hand trade uh, with the Cleveland Indians. Uh, but I still think there's a lot of untapped potential at the bat, and I think we're seeing it a little bit. 245 average, uh, 307 on base percentage. That can go up a little bit, but he has a lot of power a switch hitter, which is very attractive as a catcher. I think he's had a pretty solid year. I think he's a better option than Zunino personally, just because of what he brings offensively. Uh, and then Patino obviously has really good numbers in triple a. And uh, this is a guy that was, and still is a top 30 prospect in baseball. So they should be very excited about the career and the potential of Luis Patino. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, Patino has been, um, and you know, in, in triple A, you know, he, like, like you said, he allowed you know, one run, 28 strikeouts, four walks in those last four starts. So, um, Bettino was, like you said, looking very good. Um, and he, he should make his debut in the pros here soon. Uh, and, and Mia, Mia has been pretty solid as well for, for the race. So, um, and, and I don't know how this keeps happening with the Rays, where they just, you know, trade away a guy and they find a haul that is, um, really good and uh and and you know good for them you know i'm, I'm they're they're in that give major props to their scouting department because that's you know it takes a tremendous talent for for guys to you know scout these guys out and uh and, and props to their president of baseball ops for working out these deals and making it work for uh you know making it work for the race so um like you said they give up a major major pitcher in this league you know it's a really solid pitch pitcher and snell uh but they get back four or five guys that they think are really talented and so far they've proven to be really good mm -hmm. um i just read a headline on twitter that we're going to get into in a little bit but a very interesting development in game three of the eastern conference finals that might have the hawks season in jeopardy so we'll get into that in a little bit but there you go there's a little bit of a radio tease for you um just to get you, you know, excited about the rest of the show. But let's move on to the next one, Parker. Uh, the another Padres trade, actually, you know, the same day. Uh, this was a day, you know, um, what's oh, good lord, what's the Padres GM's name? AJ Preller. AJ Preller just went nuts on December 29th. He traded for Blake Snell and then like took an hour to celebrate, you know, get a Gatorade, hang out with his friends, call his wife, and he traded for you, Darvish. 
Um, and Darvish has been really, really good this year in San Diego. 15 games, 90 innings pitched, only 61 hits allowed, 108 strikeouts, a 2.5 ERA. They also got Victor Caratini, who's had a pretty solid year as a backup catcher for the, for the Padres. Uh, Darvish has been absolutely outstanding this season in San Diego. Uh, as you know, they were hoping for more out of Snell. They couldn't have asked for any more out of Darvish. He's been the ace of this team. He's been spectacular in his first year in San Diego. And the Padres, or the Cubs, excuse me, on the other hand, uh, get Zach Davies uh, and a couple very young prospects that we were a little bit surprised about. Parker Reginald, uh, Preciado, Owen uh, Cassie, Ismail Mania, and Yason Santana, the oldest of those four, only 18 years old. Davies this year has a 4-3-1 ERA in Chicago. Uh, has struggled with his command a little bit, also giving up a lot of hard hit contact. Uh, but the fact that they gave away um, you Darvish and just didn't get a lot of MLB talent back, um, I won't give them an F because they're sitting, you know, in a playoff spot right now in the National League. So it didn't obviously hurt them too bad. Uh, but I definitely think the Padres won this trade because. Uh, these par- these prospects could end up being the next big thing for Chicago, but they took a chance on a bunch of 16, 17-year-old kids and gave up one of the five best pitchers in baseball to do it. Yeah, they did. And, um, you know, Zach Davies has been, you know, he hasn't been what the Cubs were hoping for. Um, you know, he, he's still posting a 4-3 ERA, which isn't terrible, but, um, you know, and, and you know th- this article gave him an F on this um, because – you know, they got, you know, let's see, one, two, three, four, five guys. And four of the guys, they don't know. They have no clue. Um, but they still gave up you Darvish, who's been fantastic for Jace Tingler. Um, you know, Darvish has, you know, been, you know, like, no doubt, you know, he's, he's been really good. You know, he's started 15 games, pitched 90 innings, 10 home runs allowed, 108 Ks, 22 walks with a 2-5 ERA. So, um he he's been damn near perfect for Jace Tingler, um, and, and you know the two guys they got right before the right before the turn of the new year, um, Snell has been you know he's been a work in progress, but Darvish has been you know really good as well as Caratini, um, you know he's played well he's he's played in sixty games, um, you know he's he's hitting two twenty which isn't horrible but which isn't great either, um, but you know he's been a solid backup catcher for Jace Tingler so. Um, the Padres won this trade as of right now. We don't know what those, you know, four guys are going to do for the Cubs here in the, here in the future, but um, we do Darvish know what Darvish is doing. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, we do, and uh, he's you know played fantastically. So, um, major props to to the Padres organization. Um, you know, they've they've developed guys well, um, and you know they've they traded for guys who have been really good. And you know, Will Myers has been one of the guys they've traded for who's been fantastic. Um, you know, Tatis has obviously been a superstar, um, you know, so, the, you know, the, and they still have guys like Musgrove and Lamette that are also fantastic. So this starting rotation for um, right. for the San Diego Padres, with the exception of Snell, who ha- still has a great day every, every so often. And, you know, the starting rotation for the Padres, you know, is, is really good. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's not to, you know, it's not to discount what their batting order looks like, because that's great as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I talked about it with the White Sox a few minutes ago, and you're not going to like me saying this because you're a Dodgers fan, but I still think when the Padres get to the playoffs, it's not an if, it's a win. They're going to make the playoffs. Um, But um, that pitching rotation is just disgusting. You have Darvish, you have Snell, you have Lamette, you have Musgrove, you have Paddock. And a lot of people forget, but they also have a guy that's going to come back in 2022 that they gave up a lot for last year and Mike Clevenger. Um, So, I mean... They have six guys that are major league caliber pitchers. The worst, if, if, you know, if you're sixth best pitcher in on a major league roster is Chris Paddock, like good Lord, how good is that rotation? If you're running out Joe Musgrove as your fifth starter next year, stop it, stop it. Um, and then not to mention, they also have the top pitching prospect in all of baseball in Mackenzie Gore, who still has yet to make his major league debut, a six, five lefty that throws very, very hard and has absolute pinpoint control. Uh, so, you know, the rich get richer. And if any of these guys goes down with an injury, they also have the number three prospect in all of baseball, just waiting to make his major league debut. Yeah. And, um, you know, like you said, I'm a Dodgers fan, but you know, the team that scares me the most in this division 
is the Padres. You know, the Giants have been good all year long, but the Giants have holes. Um, this Padres team, it's very tough to find a hole with. Um, they, they, they're good on, you know, almost every aspect of this of this team. You know, their bullpen can be shaky, um, but like you said, they got plenty of starters to where they can move some of those guys to the bullpen, and they can give you, you know, you know they can give you long stretches to where um, you, your starters don't have to go deep into games. And if you know if they do go deep into games, I mean, great for them, but. Um, you have the you have the options there to you know have your guys not go deep in the games, especially when it comes to playoff time. You want those guys to be well rested, and uh, you have pitchers in your bullpen that can give you three and four innings. So, and that's extremely valuable when you get into October. Yeah, absolutely, it sure is. Uh, let's move on to the first trade of 2021. Francisco Lindor and Carlos Carrasco traded to the New York Mets. Uh, this year, Lindor obviously has not had a good season in New York, uh, 70 games, uh, nine home runs, six stolen bases, a 219 batting average, uh, an OPS plus of 92, which is below average. Um, they also, the Mets gave Lindor a huge extension of $341 million. It has not been a secret that Lindor has not been very good. Uh, he has been better as of late. Uh, and then Carrasco suffered an injury uh, with a torn right hamstring, and he has yet to make his Mets debut. Uh, so there's still a lot of time for this trade to get better for the Mets. Um, but so far, it has not started off well. I'm not going to be as harsh as this article is and give them a D, but it's definitely like a C minus. Like this was not as good as they had hoped for so far. They have a lot of money tied to Francisco Lindor. Um, I still think he's going to you know, be a very good player for the majority of that contract, but it has not looked good so far in his first season in New York. And Crosco's always had injury issues. And the fact that he hasn't even made his Mets debut, and we're almost into July. Uh, that's concerning for a team that already doesn't have Noah Syndergaard and has had Jacob deGrom suffer s- multiple injuries so far this season. So uh, as for the Cleveland side of it, Andres Jimenez, Ahmed Rosario, uh, Isaiah Green, and Josh Wolf all going to the Indians in that trade. Jimenez has really struggled this year in the majors, hitting 179 uh, with only two home runs. Uh, he's back down in Triple A, but Ahmed Rosario hasn't been half bad. Five homers, two sixty five average, uh, an OPS of about uh, seven hundred. Uh, it's still not great, but it's not bad. He's been very solid for the Mets this year. He's not Lindor, but he's been very very solid. Um, so um, as of now, I I don't know if there's a winner to this trade. I'd still lean towards the Mets won this trade because they got much more talent. Uh, but uh, so far, both sides haven't necessarily gotten what they'd hoped they'd gotten. No, and see, I don't really agree with this grade. Even though Lindor hasn't been the Lind- Lindor that we're used to seeing, he's still freaking Francisco Lindor. He's you know highly regarded as one of the best shortstops in all of baseball, mm-hmm. and you know, and for good reason. You know, Carrasco has been, um, you know, he hasn't played, um, and so. Um, and the Mets have been, you know, rough looking. Um, and I think that's that doesn't fall a lot on the players. Luis Rojas, um, I don't think is you know manager material for for the MLB. Um, but um, they you know they paid Lindor a lot of money, you know, and he was deserving of it. But if he keeps playing like this. This contract gonna look ugly coming up here in two or three years. Yeah, it sure is. And um, I I agree with you. I tend to think that they were a little harsh on the Mets just because of how poor Lindor has been so far and how Carrasco got hurt. But I still think, I mean, they traded for two really, really talented players. And DeGrom, I mean, everyone's talking about the, you know, Lindor being terrible so far and Carrasco's hurt and Syndergaard's hurt. But let's talk about the three pitchers that have stayed healthy this year. Jacob DeGrom's having maybe the greatest season by a pitcher ever. He might win MVP as a pitcher. He might win the Cy Young. He might win. Well, he will win the Cy Young. He might win MVP. He might win the Silver Slugger. He might win the Gold Glove. He might like sweep every award this year, and he would deserve it. He would. Um, Marcus Stroman has been very, very good for the Mets this year. And how about this guy? A guy that they signed in free agency. A guy that I don't think is in this article, but a guy that's been really, really good. Taiwan Walker. How good has he been for the Mets this year? He's really good. Um... And, you know, I give all the credit in the world to Steve Cohen. You know, he comes in and, you know, inherits this, you know, he bought this Mets team as a, as a fan. 
And a lot of people don't like when fans buy franchises because they, you know, they don't, that people say they don't know the sport uh, like baseball guys do, um, you know, or, and that goes, that goes, you know, that goes in any sport. Um, but I think Steve Cohen is the difference here. And I, you know, and I would tend to agree with a lot of those stereotypes with you know, fan based owners, except for, you know, the people who have, you know, owned these teams for years and years and years. Um, but, you know, we, we've, you know, Steve Cohen's a fantastic job. He, he's always reaching out to the fans. He's always, you know, you know, talking with fans to see what they want to see from the Mets. Um, you know, and the Mets have been underwhelming, but uh, they still have talent there to be really good. And, you know, Carrasco's been hurt. Syndergaard's been hurt. Uh, but, you know, this, you know, this pitching staff still has, you know, uh, uh, you know, insane potential. Um, they're, you know, they, they still have, you know, DeGrom, Syndergaard. Carrasco, you know, there, there's so many, you know, pieces on this team uh, that are still really good. So, um, you know, you know, Lindor hasn't lived up to what people thought he would, uh, but I, you know, he'll come around eventually. He sure will. Uh, I, I have no doubt in my mind. So let's move on to uh, this Padres trade with another Padres pitcher acquired. This one in late January, Joe Musgrove heads to San Diego in exchange for David Bednar, uh, Hudson Head, Omar. Cruz, Andy Rodriguez, and Drake Fellows. Uh, Musgrove has been spectacular this season. 14 games started, 85 innings, only 52 hits allowed, 103 strikeouts, only 19 walks, and a 2.22 ERA. Uh, Musgrove, he pitched the first no-hitter in Padres history in just his second start, and he's been dominant all season long. Total A-plus for this trade for the Padres. I thought it was a great trade when they did it. I thought Musgrove was one of the most underrated on the rise pitchers in baseball. He's proven me. I mean, I don't want to say he's proven me right, but he's made me look good. Um, this season, he's been really, really, really good. And I can, I mean, I like giving the Padre, the Pirates crap any chance I get because I think they're a very poorly run organization. Uh, but they didn't, they didn't screw this trade up, really. I mean, they gave up Musgrove, which was a really talented pitcher, but they got a lot of really – interesting prospects i love andy rodriguez because he can catch and play the outfield he has a really good bat he's very interesting um omar cruz a very big lefty hudson head one of the top prospects in the padres system and david bednar uh, bednar is the one player that's played for the pirates this year in the ma- in the major leagues and in 32 games he has a 3.54 era 37 strikeouts only eight walks he's been a really solid reliever and they can probably flip him at the deadline for even more prospects. So they gave up Musgrove, but I think they got a decent haul back. I'd give them a solid B for that trade. I mean, it's not the worst. It's not, they didn't, you know, rob the Padres blind, but it's a big step up from the Archer trade. I'll tell you that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you could argue that that Archer trade was um, one of the worst we've seen in a long time, but um we the, the pirates are what the tigers have been over the last five or ten years they you know they ship everybody out and they're just playing atrocious baseball for years and years on and then they put their fans through misery quite frankly but um they they are you know they they the, the pirates are how do i say this without sounding non nice they're not good we know they're not good um they, uh, like I said, you know, they're, they're the Tigers to where they put their fans through misery for a long time. But at some point, I think the Pirates will have a solid, um, you know, they'll have a space. They'll come back. You know, they're a lot like the Padres, what the Padres were a few years back. Um, I know they're, you know, they're building for the future. And, you know, and Derek Shelton's going to get fired at some point because he's just along for the, Right, that ship's gonna go down, pun intended, um, and it, it's it's not gonna be good for for pirates fans or any you know member of that organization as far as administration or coaching staff goes. Um, but you know the, the 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 pirates actually did like you said didn't didn't do terrible with this trade. Like you said, they gave up Musgrove, who's talented of obviously, um, but like you said, Andy Rodriguez is really interesting, um, as well as Bednar. So you know they get back a few you know they get back a few pitchers as well as some you know some really interesting position players. So like you said, I, I'd probably give this a solid B as well. Um, and you know like you said, they didn't completely screw this up, which is a step in the right direction for the Pirates. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Um, let's move on to, um, oh, I guess this was a three team deal as well. Um, where the Mets also got Joey Lucchese in this trade. Uh, Lucchese started off really, really poorly. 
uh, in New York. He's always had really good strikeout stuff. I've liked Lucchese back to his days in San Diego. I thought he was pretty solid. Um, but he started off really poorly, got a lot better in May, and then unfortunately tore his UCL. So he's out for all of the rest of the year, probably be out for half of next year as well. Um, so I don't, I don't know how I grade that because he had – a high, he had a high, he had a low, and he had a bad injury. So the Lucchese era in New York was kind of a weird one, but um, I still think uh, I think the Mets still have control over him for a couple more years. And when he is healthy and when he does get back, I think he's a solid pitcher. He's not going to be an ace. He's not even going to be a middle of the rotation guy. But if you're a team that has you know Joey Lucchese as your fifth starter, that's not bad at all. No, you're not. And uh, you know this is another one where the Mets. They've struggled, um, you know, and, and and like you said, he he needs Tommy John, but um, they they uh, you know they they didn't completely rob, um, you know, um, where did he come from? Oh my lord, um, he came San from Diego. San Diego, right? <laughs> You're right, yeah. So, um, you know, it was it was you know like like you said, you know, he's been injured, but he'll come back. Yeah, he sure will, and I think I mean. He has that pitch that he kind of invented. It's like a changeup that dips like a curveball, but it's faster than a curveball. He calls it the churve. He gets like 17 swings and misses with that pitch a game. Like it's disgusting. And he's like the only person I know that throws it. So uh, the churve is real. And uh, when Joey Lucchese gets back healthy, I'm excited to see him pitch some more because, I mean, there's not a lot of pitchers at the end of the day that get to say they invented a pitch. So, um, for that reason, I mean, hey, if he's a career four ERA pitcher, but he can tell his kids that he invented a pitch called the Churve, I mean, that's a win of an MLB career. Right. Um, yeah. So you know, it, it's it's a really interesting pitch. You know, to be honest with you, and um, and uh, there's a lot of guys who uh, you know, they try to make pitches work and they fail miserably, but this one's working. Mm-hmm. It sure is. He's gotten strikeouts with it his whole career, which is like. It's not a fluke at this point. If it happened for a few months, like maybe guys eventually adapt to it. But Joey Lucchese has been in the majors for, you know, four and a half years now. Like, I don't think guys are going to start magically hitting this pitch now. It's been four and a half years to try and adapt to it. So uh, it's it's weird. It's different, but it's working. And I mean, if Joey Lucchese continues to use it the way he's used it so far in his career, I mean, I think he's going to have a very successful big league career. Yeah, I think he will, too. Um, this next one's interesting to me. I don't think this is a fair grade. I really don't because I agree with you. This is, this is, you know, the Blue Jays signing George Springer, which happened on January 23rd and and they grade this, they grade this a D, but I don't think it's fair because Springer's only played like seven games Mm -hmm. and he has three home runs in those seven games. Right. And, uh, and, and, you know, the Blue Jays, and I think you'd agree with me are a lot of fun. Um, they, they are that, you know, like we said, uh, they, they got Vladdy Jr. They got Bichette, they got Springer, they got Ryu, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, as you know, a lot of pieces there that are making them really fun to watch. Um, you know, like you said, um, you know, he's, he's like, he has three homers in those seven games he's played. Um, he's hitting the one sixty average, which for seven games is, is, you know, you can't, you have, it's like, uh, it's too early to tell, but, um, he's, he, yeah, I really don't think this is fair to Springer because he's, you know, he's had a great, you know, he's had a great career with the Astros. He was an All Star, um, a World Series champion, asterisk. Um, but he, uh, you know, like he said, he's still, you know, one of, certainly one of the league's more talented outfielders. Um, he just hasn't played a whole lot. No doubt about it. I mean, there's a reason why he got thirty million dollars a year for six years at the age of thirty-one. I mean, it's. He's a very extremely talented player. He's a World Series MVP. He's the all-time leader in postseason home runs for the Astros and the all-time leader in World Series home runs for any player ever. So, um, I mean, George Springer's no, not a fluke by any means. And he literally just came back off the IL like five days ago. So, I mean, I get it that it's been a little disappointing that he's only been in the lineup for like eight games this season. But it's still George Springer. Give him two or three weeks to get back to game speed, and you're going to have yourself an all-star caliber outfielder down the stretch. Yeah, yeah. And, um, 
he'll come back. You know, he's George Springer. A lot of these guys, you know, they get hurt and they come back. You never know when they're going to come back, but he's not a pitcher. Um, and, you know, a lot of guys come back from these injuries like this um, or surgeries, and they're not the same, like we talked about with uh, with Sale earlier. But um, he's an outfielder, you know, and, and he'll come back, to, you know, just the same. Um, you know, and I saw it firsthand with Corey Seager. He had Tommy John as a shortstop, which is very bizarre. Um, but he came back and was a World Series MVP. So um, it, it's possible that, uh, you know, Springer can come back and he be even better than he was before. Mm-hmm. Let's get to this next one. I think this one's an interesting one for me, for me Parker, because uh, this is one that I didn't, agree, uh, didn't disagree with when it happened, uh, but it hasn't necessarily aged all that well. The Yankees re-signing DJ LeMahieu. Uh, this was something that had to happen. The Yankees fans were going to riot in the streets if they didn't bring back DJ LeMahieu, uh, especially because one of the teams that was rumored to be like, you know, heavily pursuing him uh, until the Yankees did resign him was division rival Toronto. Uh, if could you imagine if LeMahieu went to the blue Jays, Yankees fans would have been burning cars in the, in New York city. It would have been horrible. Um, but the Yankees do bring him back six years, $90 million. It, he hasn't been the same player this year. He's hit 261. 340 on base percentage, um, still not bad, but about league average, which is not what DJ LeMay, who usually does. He's much better than league average, obviously. His last two seasons, hitting 336 with 36 homers over the last two years combined. He's 32 years old, but the Yankees had good reasons to believe that he could keep up that production, uh, but his hard hit balls are down um, this season. Um but this year, uh, his, uh, like I said, his uh, down exit velocity and his uh, more swings and misses is kind of a little bit of a concern for the Yankees, um, not only because his numbers are down, which, like I said, he's still putting up league average numbers. But the issue for me is he's 33 years old now, and he's still got five years uh, of a contract left. And if he's playing league average now in year one, uh, this could end up being a horrible contract for the Yankees. Yeah, it could be, um, but and I like DJ LeMahieu. I'm not trying to bash on him. So, yeah, personally, I'm giving some batters some or, you know certain guys leeway um, for their numbers being down because it's harder than it's ever been to hit a baseball. It, it's it's you know insanely hard. Um, I thought it was hard to do in you know like in little league, but it was. <laughs> and it, yeah, right, it was and. Uh, but, you know, especially for these guys who are, you know, have unbelievable control, guys who can make pitches move. Um, and obviously the MLB is cracking down on things like that. But um, e- even now, you know, guys are throwing harder than they ever have. You know, I think, you know, I think Hunter Green in the minors threw like 104 miles an hour or something insane like that. Um, but um, and that's just in the minors, you know, and I you know it'll be crazy to see what he does when he makes ultimately makes the, you know, the majors with the Reds. But, um, you know, LeMayu hasn't had, you know, a whole lot of success for the for the Yankees, but he's still insanely, insanely good. And, um, mm. you know, he, he's older, you know, he's getting up there in age. He's 32. Um, but I think baseball is one of those sports where age doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, if you're still hitting the skin off the ball. He'll be around as long as, you know, the team will have you. Nelson Cruz is the perfect example. Right. Um, let's get to this next one. The Phillies re-signed JT Real Muto on January 29th to a five-year, $115 million deal. Real Muto on the year, 283 average, seven bombs, uh, an OPS of right about 850. Um, he's been very, very good this year. Um Real Muto, this was very similar to the Yankees and who The Phillies had to re-sign Real Muto. He had been the best catcher in baseball for three straight years. Um, the only issue in re-signing him was pretty clear, though. He's about to turn 30. Um, he is 30 now, by the way. Uh, he turned 30 shortly after signing that deal um, and having a catcher under contract for five years and over $100 million when he's already 30 is very, very risky. Um, he's still very, very... Uh, swinging the bat very, very well um, and playing very strong defense as well. So as of now, I think this is a good contract for the Phillies because they kept the best catcher in baseball who's been one of their best hitters. Uh, But down the road, this is something to keep your eye on because at the age of 33, 34, 
Uh, is Real Muto still going to be playing? I'm not worried about Real Muto's ability to hit. I think he can do that up until he's 35. I'm worried about if he's going to be able to crouch behind the plate every game. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, you know, <laughs> I hate to be, you know, the the, the old man hater, um, but, you know, as, as these catchers get older, you know, but Yadi Molina has proved me wrong a little bit with that, but as these catchers get older, um, you get knee issues. You do. And, um, uh, but Remilto, I still I still think is the league's best catcher. You know, and and um, Philadelphia, you know they they need him around. Um, and like this article says, I'd give it an A grade. You know, he's still the league's best catcher in my opinion. Um, and and he's playing well. You know, two eighty three, not horrible. Um, and really it's pretty good, good for actually. A catcher, honestly, right? No, it's pretty good actually for like you said for a catcher and. Um, it's you know I think that's above league average right now. So um, seven homers in fifty seven games. He's playing well, um, and uh, and you know, one thirty eight OPS plus. So he, he's playing really well right now, and uh, I'm sure Joe Girardi's loving that. No doubt about it. You love to have those guys that you can count on day in day out. Uh, let's talk about the trade on February first that shocked the league. The Cardinals acquired Nolan Arenado. Arenado on the year hitting two seventy uh, with an OPS of right about um, 840. Uh, He's been really strong so far in his first season as a Cardinal. Uh, His defense has been really, really good. His 135 OPS, like I said, OPS plus, excuse me, uh, even better than what he accomplished um, in his time in Colorado. Um, The Cardinals obviously aren't playing great. Um, A lot of lack of depth in the rotation. They're now eight games out of first place, and I think – six games um four games under 500 or something like that so it has not been a year for cardinals fans to cherish so far uh, but the fact that they have no one are not a long term and the fact that he's playing like this in his first couple months as a cardinal definitely something to be excited about because this is the biggest star that the cardinals have had since albert pools right and and we were at it on the rockies um when they went this and trade they deserved down. it we we were live at the Nutter Center when this trade went down. We were at halftime, Shay, but um, the yeah, you know the, the you know the Cardinals, you know you know they won this trade obviously because you get Nolan Arenado, who's one of the league's best third baseman, if not the best third baseman in baseball, um, and and like you said, Matt Carpenter last year was, you know, he got most of the playing time. Um, he hit one eighty six with a six forty OPS. I mean, he got on base, but. You know, he, he didn't hit the ball well. So, um, yeah, but they give this they give this trade a B for the Colorado Rockies, who, you know, Gomber hasn't been, you know, um, he hasn't been great, but he hasn't been terrible either. Um, the Rockies are a dumpster fire anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Bud Black is going to be fired at the end of the year, if not before that. Um, and, and they're another one of these teams like, you know, like the uh, – um, the the Tigers to where they're rebuilding. So, um, you know they're they're in that phase. You know, you know the Tigers and the the, the Pirates as well. So, uh, the you know the Rockies are on the you know the more of the beginning stages of that. So you know they 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 ship they ship off their uh, you know their star third baseman. Story's not by star not far behind them. Um, but you know this this was a you know like you said a league shocking trade, no doubt. Yeah, and I mean. Let's really quickly, before we get to the last one, I do want to bring up that uh, the Rockies didn't lose this trade as bad as I thought they might have right at the beginning. uh, Because let's talk about, I mean, what they got. They got Austin Gomber, Mateo Gill, uh, Elahuris Montero, Tony Losey, and Jake Somers. Um, Montero, Losey, and Gill are all in the top 30 prospects in the Rockies system. So they got a lot of depth at the prospect position and Austin Gomber, which was considered the highlight of the trade. He's been really, really good. Uh, 15 games this year, almost 80 innings pitched 76 strikeouts, a 368 ERA. And here's the crazy part, Parker, a 148 ERA at Coors field and only a 167 average against and one home run allowed. I mean, he's been, I know it's only two months into his time in Colorado, but pitchers don't usually win in the matchup against Coors Field. And so far, Austin Gomber's been dominant in Colorado. Yeah, you took the words right out of my mouth. You know, we don't see pitchers be dominant in a hitter's park like Coors Field. But like you said, 
15 games, 78 innings pitched. Um, you know, he, he hasn't been, uh, you know, he hasn't been, you know, fantastic away from Coors Field, but a 1-4-8 ERA um, at Coors Field is, you know, quite an accomplishment, really, because even some of the league's best aren't, you know, they aren't great at Coors Field because, you know, thin air, all travels farther, you know, it's just, it's just science, um, baseball science, so, um, yeah, so Gomber is, like you said, um, I would agree with you in the fact that they didn't lose this trade, and they, you know, as bad as they, we initially thought they lost the trade, but, you know, well, not as bad as they we originally thought, right. so, um, this one is, this one is, you know, Gomber's panned out pretty well for the Rockies, um, surprisingly, you know, we both thought, like, Austin Gomber, really? For Nolan Arenado and you know when they few... could have had well, right because we were like well they could have had Matthew Liberatore or Nolan Gorman or if you're gonna get you know a pitching prospect from the Cardinals you got to get Liberatore you got to get um um you know Dakota Hudson or somebody like that somebody that's got a little bit more hype to their name it just felt like Austin Gomber was a guy that was pitching out of the bullpen and long relief for the Cardinals and it's like you're really gonna build the Arenado trade off of this guy but. I'll admit when I'm wrong, and I was wrong about Austin Gomber. He's been really good so far. Yeah, yeah, as was I. You know, I, I didn't expect him to be this great um, at Coors Field. Um, and, you know, he's he's obviously done um, much worse away from Coors Field, um, which is surprising. Like we said, because it's a hitter's park. So um, this one is, you know, you know, gr- great for the Cardinals. I know you hate to hear that, but. Um, this, this is, you know, this has been good for the Cardinals as well as, um, it, it's panned out better than we thought for Colorado. And let's get to the final one here. Uh, the LA Dodgers signed Trevor Bauer on February 11th. Um, Bauer's been really, really good this year for the Dodgers. Uh, 101 innings pitched. He's one of, I think, three pitchers over the hundred innings mark. Uh, he's been an innings eater, a two, five, seven ERA, 129 strikeouts, a one forty seven ERA plus. He has given up 17 home runs, but he's limited the, you know, the damage it does with that 257 ERA. Um, like uh, the the Dodgers are the defending champions. They didn't need Trevor Bauer, but to pair him with guys like Urias, to pair him with guys like Kershaw and Bueller, and um, the fact that they were able to move David Price to the bullpen, uh, what a luxury for the defending champions. And it actually ended up working out because Dustin May got hurt. And now that Bauer signing is looking really, really good for the Dodgers. Cause if they didn't end up landing Trevor Bauer and Dustin May got hurt, uh, the Dodgers might be in a lot more trouble with their pitching depth. But uh, obviously it's a lot of money that they committed to Trevor Bauer, the biggest contract in MLB history in terms of per year uh, salary. But so far Bauer has been really, really good. He's been the ACE caliber pitcher that they expected him to be. And um uh, I, I I mean I think that warrants an A. I think it's I think the Dodgers are happy with how Bauer's playing, and I think Bauer's happy to be a Dodger. So I think both sides win. Yeah, they do. And um, you know, and I was talking about this with one of a friend of mine earlier tonight. Bauer's been one of the guys that the MLB is going to really keep track on with this sticky substance thing because he was one of the guys who you know he's he's never been shy about voicing his opinion. Um, and you know, he was one of the guys that went after the MLB pretty hard on this. Um, and, and he's, you know, his spin rates down since they cracked down on this. So, um, but there's still no doubt that he's, you know, among the top pitchers in baseball. Um, like you said, they didn't need Trevor Bauer. Um, you know, it was, you know, a lot of us thought he was going to New York for a while there. Um, but you know, the Dodgers get him and I'm not certainly not complaining. Don't get me wrong. Um, but they, they, um, you know he's he's you know his spin issues were or you know he had spin issues coming up you know in here in the recent weeks since they started cracking down on this sticky substance stuff but um you know he's he like you said he's an innings eater um in a rotation that's among the league's best you know you, you you pair him with you pair him with Kershaw you pair him with Urias you pitch him you you pair him with um you know as well as um oh why am I blanking why do I not know my own team's starting rotation I just look like an idiot on YouTube here, but Bueller. Um, wait, hang Bueller. on. Bueller. My Bueller. lord. Wow. Bueller. Wow. So it's, it's so it's Bueller, Bauer, Kershaw, Kershaw Urias, and who's the fifth? Um, it was it was May before they lost him for the year. Yeah. Um, I think that I think they're going back and forth between three or four, 
two or three guys, but okay. um, yeah, uh, Bauer's been you know really good. Uh, even you know, even though you know his spin rate has been down, but um, he's still among the league's best. Yeah, he sure is. Um, well, because we're on YouTube only today, we don't need to take a break, so we can go right into this NFL topic. Uh, but first, uh, the Bucks beat the Hawks in Game Three tonight, one twelve, one hundred two. Uh, take the two games to one series leads. So the Bucks are halfway to the NBA Finals. Uh, Chris Middleton with 38 points tonight. He played great. Um, here's the thing, though, that really th- uh, worries me about the Hawks' chances in this series. Uh, Trey Young going back on defense in that third quarter, uh, stepped on the ref's foot, uh, sprained his right ankle pretty good, left the game for a bit, came back, tried to kind of run around on it, but uh, – the damage was done by that point. It was a close game, and then Trey Young got hurt, and then the Bucks kind of took control. And if Trey Young's not at 100%, uh, Giannis and Chris Middleton are playing really good basketball right now, as is Drew Holiday. If Trey Young's not at 100%, I, I mean, I hate to say it, but I don't know if the Hawks can beat this Bucks team uh, without a healthy Trey Young. Obviously, I wasn't sure if the Hawks could beat this Bucks team with a healthy Trey Young, but if Trey Young's not 100%, I don't like the Hawks' chances. No, no. Um, you know, obviously, Trey Young's been their star, um, and, and you know we saw that. Um, you know we've seen that through the entirety of the NBA playoffs, and uh, e- even with uh, you know with the you know as good as the Bucks have been, um, Trey Young, you know he put up thirty five tonight. He was great, um, but the injuries um, are certainly a concern. Um, you know, but you still have guys that can you know play well. Um, Danilo Gallinari played well. He had 18 tonight. John Collins had 13, as well as Kevin Herter had 11. Um, so you know they fall, they come up short tonight. Chris Middleton outplayed Giannis tonight. He had 32 minutes with 38 points. Um, even though Giannis was great, he had 33 with 11. Um, this Bucks team is still really good. That uh-huh. they are, and um, uh, we 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 thought you know early in the early in the playoffs that we might see a a Nets. You know, and that's Bucks Eastern Conference Finals, but it's been Bucks Hawks. Um, we might see a Bucks Suns Finals. Um, this is going to be, you know, really fun to watch. So, um, you know, Atlanta is certainly not out of it by any means. No, not um, at all. N- nowhere close. Um, they- they're still one of the leagues. You know, there's they're still one of the Final Four in this in this you know the NBA playoffs right now. So, um, and they they've won a game. It's not like they're down three zero. They they still have a fighting chance. So. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Um, Trey Young, even though he's, he's you know he's kind of on the fritz, he's going to find a way to play because he's you know he's you know one of the stars of the league right now, you know no doubt about that. So uh, they find a way to play, um, you know unless it's you know it's not COVID related. If he can go, he'll go. He sure will. And uh, all right, Parker. Well, before we get into this NBA coaches tier list here to end the show today, uh, David DeCastro released by the Pittsburgh Steelers earlier this week. A little bit of a surprise. I know he'd been dealing with an ankle injury and uh, was kind of contemplating uh, what his future in the NFL would be, but this is still a two-time All-Pro guard uh, and like a seven-time Pro Bowler. I mean, this is one of the best in the league uh, when he's healthy. So I found this article, Parker, on four teams uh, that could be potential landing spots for David DeCastro after his release from Pittsburgh. Uh, and number one probably won't come as a shock to a lot of people. It's the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, you know, the, the and AFC North as a whole uh, is very offensive line in the trenches oriented football. A lot of strong defensive fronts, a lot of strong offensive lines, um, a lot of good running backs. It's a very kind of, you know, nose to the grindstone down in the trenches, get dirty kind of division. Uh, and the Bengals uh, might be his best bet to stay in that style of football. The Bengals had to remake the offensive line, like I said, after the injury to Joe Burrow. Uh, But the decision to take Jamar Chase over Panay Sewell kind of hangs over the the club uh, because Riley Reef isn't necessarily a huge upgrade at right tackle. They have Jackson Carmen, who's going to compete for a guard spot. uh, But they have Quentin Spain and Xavier Suafilu, who are more kind of depth pieces than starting caliber guards. So if they can land a guy like DeCastro... um, it could still give Carmen a chance to start as a rookie and learn from one of the top offensive guards in the NFL, but it makes Suafilo and Spain backup guys that can play across the line instead of starters, which I think improves the Bengals offensive line as a whole uh, because it makes their depth a lot better. Yeah, it does. And um, 
I was on the Penny Sewell train as far as draft um, capital goes for the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, I know you were on the Chase train, and I know you're very happy when they drafted Chase. Um, but, you know, Joe Burrow's protection is very, you know, crucial. Um, and I'm and I'm always a big fan of protecting the quarterback. It's what ended Andrew Luck's career, um, which you know I'm um, I'm over it. I promise you. I, you know I you know I still talk about it, but I promise you I'm over it. I'm over it. I swear. But um, okay, the uh, um, like you said, Riley Reef is um, you know he's he's serviceable. You know he'll he'll give you he'll play good ball for you, but he's not that top tier. Lyman that everybody looks for, and DeCastro is that. And you know, as surprising as it was to see him be released from Pittsburgh here last week, um, it's possible that you know the Bengals are, like you said, the the number one front runner for DeCastro here. Yeah, and two more reasons why I think it makes a lot of sense is one, the Bengals uh, didn't. I mean, they had they spent some money in free agency on guys like Trey Hendrickson and Shadobi Awuzie, and. Uh, you know, Larry Okunjobi, guys like that. But they still have a lot of cap space. And um, like I said, with Joe Burrow suffering that injury, I, I think they'd be willing to pay more than almost any other team to get to Castro, uh, which obviously money talks to any football player. So if the Bengals give him the biggest contract, I mean, it'd be hard for him to say no. And another reason why I think this makes a lot of sense is the Bengals and Steelers love, absolutely love, one upping each other and getting in each other's ways of building a good football team. So what are the Bengals thinking right now? Steelers just cut one of the best offensive linemen in the NFL because he has an injury that they're worried might affect his career. Well, if we give him a medical check and we think he's good to go, what would stick it to the Steelers more than making him our new all pro right guard protecting Joe Burrow? Yeah. Um, and I know plenty of Steelers fans. My brother's one of them. I went to high school with a lot of Steelers fans. Um, and, you know, the Bengals, I don't want to say they've been pushovers when it comes to the Steelers, but they quite well, they frankly have. have. <laughs> um, and they, they have. So um, I, I'm, ex, you know, I'm excited to see what the Bengals look like. And um, I'm really hoping that they're really good. Uh, like I've said it many times, for the sake of my own humility, I'm hoping that they're really good. So, um, and and adding David DeCastro will just, you know, hopefully make my point be even more proven. Um, you know, there's still, we still have a whole NFL season to go through. Um, and and it's possible that I look like, will look like a fool, you know, coming up here, at, at, you know, at the end of the year. But um, I'm excited to see what the Bengals look like. And if they add to Castro, that certainly makes them even better than they were before. Sure does. Let's move on to the second team, the Las Vegas Raiders. The Raiders took a strange uh, route to blowing up the offensive line this year. So why not cap it off by adding to Castro? They traded away Rodney Hudson, Trent Brown, and Gabe Jackson before drafting Alex Leatherwood. Uh, the big weakness in the plan to date might be penciled in guard Denzel Good who earned a 56.7 pro football focus grade last year over almost 1,000 snaps. That's where DeCastro comes into play. If the goal is to make sure Leatherwood develops properly on the edge while Carr attempts another 500 passes, slapping a veteran like DeCastro would make a ton of sense. Yeah, it would. Um, and and you know how much you know how much John Gruden loves his quarterbacks, and, and I know he loves protecting those quarterbacks just as much. You know, drafting uh, Leatherwood for, you know, all of us when we did our draft review was a huge head scratcher. It was. Um, you know, this was a guy they could have easily gotten in the second round. Um, they could have drafted a guy like, you know, um, Derisaw or, uh, you know, as well as, you know, they could have added to that defense. But they go with Mayock and uh, Gruden and company go with Leatherwood. Um, so we'll see if they can uh, – and, you know, add this, add, add to Castro here, because like you said, they, you know, they blew up this offensive line, getting rid of Hudson Brown and Gabe Jackson. So um, if they can add to Castro, they'll have a solid veteran piece as that cornerstone of that offensive line. Uh, that's going to, you know, be a lot of new faces in front of Derek Carr. Yeah, it sure is. And I mean, um, it's, it's, it's weird to think about the talk. It's, I don't know. It still hasn't really sat with me that we're talking about David DeCastro potentially signing with a different team, but 
uh, that's exactly what, you know, the, the situation to rise here. The third team, uh, and this is the one that would, you know, I think make a lot of sense, but would also break my heart, uh, the New England Patriots. Uh, the Patriots took one of the bigger losses of the offseason um, when Joe Tooney went to Kansas City. They did get David Andrews back, uh, but didn't address the offensive line as a whole until the sixth round of the draft. It was a weird approach. Uh, considering how much of the free agency spending went to remaking the roster um, on offense. Still, the Patriots could back into an upgrade if David DeCastro wants to play. Um, The Patriots seem to hope that the return of Trent Brown can kind of tighten up that offensive line, Uh, but DeCastro is a known commodity and gives the Patriots options while trying to protect Cam Newton or breaking in their first-round pick, Mac Jones. Yeah, and this be just in Bill Belichick's wheelhouse after the offseason he had. Bill Belichick was looking like the San Diego Padres out here, you know, making trades and signing literally everybody um, to to add to, you know, the number 50 there in Mac Jones, which is still very bizarre to me. Um, but, um, yeah, this would make a ton of sense. You know, like you said, the lost Tooney still have Andrews, but, um, you know, who's going to be, is it going to be Cam? Is it going to be Mac Jones? Is it, well, I know we're going to see both. It's just a matter of when. Um, so, uh, th- this is interesting. Like you said, I know, I, you know, it breaks my heart as well that, you know, this, this is a possibility, but you know, it's a real possibility and it makes sense. So, um, we'll see what Bill decides to do. I will never, you know, project what Bill Belichick is going to do because he surprises me time and time again. Um, so we'll see what, uh, you know, where DeCastro lands. I still think the Bengals make the most sense on this list, but the Patriots are certainly favorites. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the final team on this list, uh, the Seattle Seahawks. Uh, at a time when it's necessary to do whatever Russell Wilson wants to keep him in Seattle, the Seahawks should probably be sniffing around DeCastro, who grew up in the Seattle area and played high school football in Washington. Uh, For now, the Seahawks intend to start 24-year-old Damian Lewis at guard, uh, though a move to center might not hurt, thanks to the underwhelming battle there. Uh, Seattle also traded for the aforementioned Gabe Jackson, but he shouldn't just be locked into a starting role after a pretty poor season a year ago. The Seahawks gave him a three-year extension, but everything pales in comparison to making sure one of the league's best quarterbacks wants to stay in Seattle long term to Castro would allow or Seattle would allow to Castro to go home and also play for a team that has a chance to win a Super Bowl for the Seahawks. It might be another positive step towards getting back to the Super Bowl and protecting their superstar quarterback. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of this Russell Wilson noise from, you know, what I've heard uh, was just a lot of, um, you know, just white noise and, and kind of, um, you know, stuff that was, you know, not really true. Um, whether that is true, I don't know. But, um, you know, and, and they they made a big deal out of protecting Russell Wilson. Um, and that was one of the, you know, alleged reasons why he was upset with John Schneider. But, um, yeah, this this one makes, you know, you know, a lot of sense. It does. All of these make sense. Um, but protecting Russell Wilson has been, uh, you know, a big key factor in, uh, you know, in the Seahawks offseason. They haven't really made it a whole, uh, you know, a huge priority, um, but they could make a splash here. Yeah, they sure could. Um, and it's still not a guarantee that David DeCastro comes back after the surgery. I mean, there he has talked in an interview that, you know, it depends on how the surgery goes. He said he's fine kind of, you know, calling it a career and walking away if he feels like it's too difficult to play football at this point in his career. But I think if he does come back, uh, I, I, I forgot to mention this, but he did say in an interview uh, that he wasn't happy with how the, you know, the Steelers relationship ended uh, because he's only missed seven games in his 10 year career, Parker. And, um, you know, he played through a lot of last year with a really bad angle injury, which is what he's getting surgery on. Um, and Steelers, you know, cut him, but not just cut him. Uh, they released him with a non-football injury liability clause so they didn't have to pay him that extra money. And uh, I think that rubbed DeCastro the wrong way because that's kind of what he was talking about in that press conference. So I'm a Bengals fan. Yeah, I have clouded vision and, and un- unrealistic expectations, but there's part of me that thinks if this guy's ankle surgery goes well and he wants to play football again, 
he might come to the Bengals just out of spite, not just because it's a good opportunity for him to play football again and start for a, you know, a team that has a really talented quarterback and be a top tier guard in the NFL, but also because if he comes to the Bengals, he gets a chance to, you know, stick it to the Steelers twice a year. Before I elaborate on what you just said, clouded vision is very much so in your wheelhouse when it comes mm-hmm. to, you know, uh, the Bengals and especially this Trevor Story nonsense. Good Lord. I didn't, but, even bring, I didn't even bring it up today. I'm proud of you. We've, we've made it almost through an entire show and you haven't brought it up. So I'm proud of you on that. Um, but I completely wholeheartedly agree with what you're saying. You know, the, the Steelers situation didn't end well for DeCastro. And like you said, this may be the way he gets back at him. You know, he's he still has, um, I, I I don't think he's done by any means. So th- this might be a way he gets back at, you know, Tomlin and um, and Kevin Colbert and company in Pittsburgh. And he just, you know, protects Joe Burrow because I know that Steelers fans would hate to see that. Hey, I'll tell you what, man. If the Bengals and the Steelers play late in the season next year and, you know, both teams are fighting for, uh, if let's say everything goes right for the Bengals, Burrow stays healthy, he's playing well, and the Bengals are fighting for a playoff spot. Um, David DeCastro potentially blocking TJ Watt is the best option the Bengals have had in five years. So I'll take it. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and like, like we've talked about offensive line was a major need for the Bengals going into this off season. And, uh, you know, you know, Riley reef is, is not, um, a, you know, a key, you know, like a you know major player here. Um, you know, he's, like I said, he's serviceable and he, he'll get the job done. But mm-hmm. if you have the chance to get David D. Castro, you go try to get him. No, oh, absolutely. I mean, nobody expected DeCastro to be available. I mean, Riley Reefs, like you said, a serviceable above average offensive tackle. David DeCastro, when he's healthy, is probably, you know, the third best guard in the NFL behind Quentin Nelson and Zach Martin, who are both, you know, future Hall of Famers. So, yeah, yeah. It's so. I mean, we're not talking about an above average, solid offensive lineman like with Riley Reef. We're talking about one of the best of the best. Yeah, we are. So, um, he, he, like you said, he's up there with Nelson and and Zach Martin. And there's a few other names that we're we're missing that are still really good. And, you know, good offensive linemen and guards in in this league. And DeCastro's up at the top with him. So, um, you know, he, he's an older player. He's he's a major veteran, and he could give this, um, you know, this young big offensive line that you know the shot of veteran leadership that they need. Yeah, he sure could. Um, I don't know what just happened there. Hang on one sec. Okay, we're good. Um, but I, I think I, I totally agree with you. I think that I mean, he's. This wasn't something that was supposed to happen. This wasn't the Steelers weren't supposed to cut David DeCastro. Uh, so this is just something that, you know, teams are, I feel like are just adapting to um, as the um, off season unfolds. And I mean, Quentin Nelson's still only 25 years old and he's probably the best offensive guard, maybe even the best offensive lineman in the NFL. But um, it feels like David DeCastro has been in the league forever. He's only one year older than Zach Martin. He's 31. Zach Martin's 30. So, I mean, uh, I still think, like you said, if this ankle surgery goes well, I still think David DeCastro has got four, maybe even five years of solid football in him. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, we know these offensive linemen are, you know, going deeper, deeper into their careers. Andrew Whitworth is the perfect example. Um, it seems like he had a resurgence in Los Angeles with the Rams. So don't remind me. (laughs) DeCastro still certainly has talent to, you know, play in the league for at least, like you said, at least another five or six years. No doubt about it. All right, Parker. Well, we got about, you know, technically we have about 30 minutes left in the show, but I think we'll go a little over two hours since we're YouTube only today uh, to do this tier list. But I'll get our, you know, our tier list pulled up today. We have a fun one. Uh, We started the show talking about Penny Hardaway potentially being the next coach of the Orlando Magic. So I put together an NBA coaches tier list today. We have 27 coaches on here. Um, the only three that we don't have are new Orleans, Orlando, and Washington, the three teams that don't have a coach at the moment. But look, I even threw on this list, um, Udoka new with the Celtics. I threw on, um, you know, Chauncey Billups with the Portland trailblazers. I threw on, uh, as well as, 
you know, the newest head coach of your Indiana Pacers, Parker, our Indiana Pacers, I should say, uh, and Rick Carlisle. So I have all the new coaching changes on here, uh, but let's get started. Who do you want to start with, Parker? Let's start with some of the new faces, new places. I know. Let's start with, you know, Udoka, who personally for me okay. is, you know, in the don't know category because he hasn't for sure know, he hasn't he hasn't coached at all yet but uh, you know from everything i've seen you know brad stevens is a big fan you know the players are a big fan and this is a really high you know quality signing for boston it it sure is and i mean guys don't just be guys just aren't um an assistant a, you know a top tier assistant for greg popovich for eight years unless greg popovich thinks you're one hell of a coach um so this guy, I mean, he's coached under Doc Rivers. He's coached under um, Steve Nash. He's coached under uh, Greg Popovich. Um, so this is a guy that's coached under some really big names, and you know they have praise for him. So even though he hasn't coached a game in the NBA yet, and I agree with you that he belongs and don't know until I know what he can do, um, he's a very hyped up coach, and I wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me at all if you know he gets the Celtics off and running next year, and he's you know. A star coach in year one yeah yeah you know you know it's possible that we might see um, a, I know a similar situation to what Monty Williams has done this year with the Suns um you know he you know injects some new life into the Boston roster which you know is you know is needed um after you know eight, seven or eight years of Brad Stevens and I'm not saying that Brad Stevens was a bad coach by any means because he was fantastic but um, you know, uh, and just sometimes a new shot of adrenaline is what you need. And we might see it here with, you know, Udoka and Boston. Yeah, we sure might. Uh, let's get to uh, another one uh, that's relatively new, but it's a guy that we can actually uh, put in a tier, Parker. And that's going to be, um, you know, about to enter his second year as the head coach in the NBA, Steve Nash with the Brooklyn Nets. Now, this one's tough because obviously Brooklyn had a lot of talent with Harden and um, Kyrie Irving, J- Blake Griffin, Kevin Durant, DeAndre Jordan, um, well, Marcus Aldridge for a little bit. Um, so I can't put Steve Nash up here because I don't know how much of it was him and how much of it was the players on his team. Uh, but I do think that he did a really good job um, keeping that team bought in, keeping that team playing together, keeping that team you know working together throughout the course of the season. So I think he definitely has traits that make him a very good coach. And I'm going to put him in B tier. Uh, I still need to see some more of Steve Nash to put him in that top tier. Uh, But I did see enough of him maintaining that roster and keeping them focused on that long-term goal of winning a championship. Uh, But I think he's definitely trending in the right direction. Yeah, I would agree with you. Um, You, you have to, you know, manage the stars you have, especially when you have stars like they do in Brooklyn. And that's not an easy thing to do because guys, you know, they want their minutes, they want their shot attempts, they want their, you know, chances to do what they do. And uh, when you have, you know, four and five guys that are really all-star talented, former all-star players, I mean, players that have won finals before, um, they want their shots, they want their chance to be great. And, you know, I think Steve Nash did a very good job managing all of that. Uh, like you said, we don't know how great of an actual basketball coach that he is because of how much of it was him and how much of it was the players on his team. Uh, but like you said, I think he did a very good job man- managing the team chemistry, and he's going to be in B tier for me also. All right, well, let's do one that uh, – this is really hard for me to do, Parker, because I really want J.B. Bickerstaff to be good. I like him a lot. Every time I hear him in an interview, I think that you know he has a great mind. Um, I think the players love him. But I have to base this off of, you know, the success he has as an NBA head coach. And he wasn't very good in Memphis. He got a second chance in Cleveland and he started off strong. I think they went like eight and four in his first 12 games. But after that, they fell off. The Cavaliers, once again, are going nowhere. Uh, they might be trading. There's rumors that they might be trading Colin Sexton to the Pelicans for Brandon Ingram. Uh, I don't know what they're going to do. Uh, but Bickerstaff, I mean, as much as I want to like him, he's just not had success as an NBA head coach. And for that, I have to put him in D tier. Yeah, I did too. Um, you know, it, th- there's there's been lots of turnover in Cleveland with head coaches over the last few years. Um, you know, and how and how much of that was LeBron? I'd say it was pretty good. You know, pretty good amount. You know, they had David Blatt. Uh, they had they had Ty, Ty Lue, Lue. Um, and now it's Bickerstaff. So and they also, I mean, throw in the three quarters of a season they had of John Beeline. 
Right. So, um, and, and like you said, we're just basing this off success, um, uh, not only over their careers, but what they've done, you know, so far in recent years. And, you know, and we just haven't seen a whole lot from Picker's staff. So he's going to be in D tier for me as well. All right, Parker. Well, let's, you know, get out of the dumps with guys that we don't know as well. And let's do a guy that has been in the league for a while and has proven himself. And I think he had a very, very solid year. And for that, I'm going to be pretty nice to him. And that's Tom Thibodeau, the reigning coach of the year in the NBA with the New York Knicks. Now, if we did this, you know, a couple months ago, I'd probably put him in C tier Parker because he had a really strong start to his career. And, um, but he'd kind of fallen off towards the end of his tenure with the Bulls. He'd kind of fallen off in his tenure with the Timberwolves. Uh, but he's joined a Knicks team that was had talent, but wasn't supposed to get where they got to. And he did a very good job with them. And, the, you know, they can only move forward because they're going to have the slot to bring in a superstar. Uh, and this should be a better team next year. So I'm going to put him in B tier and I'm going to put him ahead of Steve Nash because he's obviously proven more than Steve Nash. Uh, but Tom Thibodeau, Tom Thibodeau had a heck of a year this year as the Knicks head coach. Uh, and I think he's back to being a really solid NBA coach. He is, um, you know, he was in Chicago for a while and, uh, I believe he was the coach, you know, you know, 10 or so years ago when Chicago had their run up being, you know, you know, playoff teams with Derrick Rose and all them, but, um, you know, he was in Minnesota as well. Um, but you know, this year he's, you know, you know, obviously one coach of the year, he was great in New York with the Knicks. Um, and, and like you said, I don't think this is, you know, Tom Thibodeau isn't done and, and uh, We'll see what he does here coming up, you know, as, as the, 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 what the Knicks do here in this off season. Uh, can they retain a few of their players? Can they add a max player? Um, so it, there, there's a lot of questions surrounding the Knicks. We'll see how Thibodeau and, and company handle it. You know, I, obviously it's not all on him. It's how their front office handles the off season. Um, but, you know, if they come out of here, if they come out of the off season with a, you know, a good haul and they, you know, bring in a max player, uh, I think the Knicks will be even better. And uh, that's a credit to Tom Thibodeau. So he's going to be beat here for me as well. All right, Parker, well, let's let, let's get him off the list because I'm sick and tired of waiting to talk about him. Uh, Greg Popovich, let's just drag him up to S tier. And honestly, what I should have done uh, was had a goat tier um, because we talk about the MJ versus LeBron debate. Uh, it's pretty similar when it comes to coaches. It's the, it's the Phil Jackson versus Popovich debate. I mean, if you say Phil Jackson's the GOAT, I mean, I won't disagree with you. If you say Greg Popovich is the GOAT, I won't disagree with you. Uh, but Greg Popovich is a top two NBA head coach of all time. And whether you put him at one or two, he's the best coach in the NBA. He's been the best coach in the NBA. Uh, and he is, you know, the day he's eligible for the Hall of Fame, I expect to hear his Hall of Fame speech. Yeah, I mean, I have no argument. You know, he's, you know, he's been uh one you know the goat of modern era of coaches um and that's not to that's not to discount what phil jackson did because i still think i still consider him the best nba coach ever um but you know greg popovich has obviously you know done fantastic things um his his he has a heck of a coaching tree um and that's not to you know that's not to not mention that his press conferences are hilarious um so I love pop and it's going to be a sad day when he ultimately retires, which I, I still, what I think is not is, you know, sooner rather than later. But like you said, as soon as he comes up on the ballot, he's in. Yeah. And that, no doubt about it. And part of me, part of me honestly thinks that pop might coach until the day that he dies. Uh, but uh, we'll see. Uh, let's get to a guy that's still in the playoffs, Parker. And that's Monty Williams. Uh, we both love this guy. Uh, at the start of his career, he'd probably go in C tier. He did not have the greatest start to his coaching career, but he's just gotten better and better every single year. He's improved as a coach. And um, it reminds me a lot of a guy like, um, you know, like a Brandon Ingram or a Julius Randle, where they go from being kind of a meh player to just being a really, really good all-star caliber guy because they just keep putting the work in. And that's Monty Williams. And he has the Suns one win away from the NBA Finals. I can't put him in S tier quite yet, but he is very comfortably in A tier for me. I think Monty Williams has, you know, really put the work in and is now uh, arguably a top five coach in the NBA. Yeah, he is. And this is this is a guy who I thought, we both thought, should have won coach of the year um and he, he he was deserving of it you know and not to say that's not to say that tom thibodeau wasn't but um you know 
Phoenix has obviously gone further into the playoffs. They're in the Eastern Conference Finals. They're uh, almost or Western Conference Finals. They're almost to the NBA Finals. Uh, quite honestly, so uh, Monty Williams deserves to be an A tier with what he's done in Phoenix, and uh, I have no problem putting him here. I do. I mean, I don't either. I think that uh, he's uh, he he was an assistant with Coach K on the U.S. national team, but you know he was the head coach for the Pelicans uh, for six years. He coached Chris Paul there for a little bit, uh, but like I said, he wasn't that great um, in that first stop. He ended up going in his career. Uh, with the Hornets, uh, I mean, they, they had a couple years where they made the playoffs. He went 173 and 221, uh, but went two and eight in the playoffs. Um, he never really got that second chance, though, and he would coach as an assistant in Philly for a few years. Uh, but he, they signed um, the the Suns signed him in ni- uh, May of 2019. Uh, he wasn't great in his first year, but then the bubble, he went eight, they went eight and oh. Um, and then this year they've just been outstanding. And uh, like I said, it's just, he's, uh, I keep coming back to the fact that he's the Brandon Ingram of the, um, you know, of coaches where he started off and everyone's like, oh, you know, he's not as good as he should be. He's okay, but he's not as good as he should be. And he just gets better and better and better. And now when we talk about Brandon Ingram, we're like, that's a certified bucket. That's a damn good player. And that's what we feel about Monty Williams. Now it's like, that's a damn good coach. Yeah. It's, and uh, th- that's how a lot of people feel. And it's, it's, it's very evident that the players in Phoenix love playing for him. So um, he must be doing something right. If the players love playing for you. So, um, you know, I, I'm really excited to see what Monty Williams does here in the years ahead. Yeah. No doubt about it. Let's knock out another um, don't know here, Parker Chauncey Billups just named the coach of the uh, Portland trailblazers today. Um, Very similar to you. Doke has been an assistant, his whole coaching career. He was an assistant for Ty Lue in LA this year. Um, I don't know anything about him as a coach. I I don't know anything about, I I don't know anything about, you know, this opportunity that he has here in Portland. Uh, I know that he has Damian Lillard as of now, which is a nice first step. Uh, but I'm excited to see what Chauncey Billups does in his first experience as a head coach. But as of now, obviously, uh, I don't know enough to give him a, a proper ranking. Yeah, I don't either. You know, he, he's been, uh, you know, a hot name uh, in coaching searches over the last two, three years. He finally gets a job in Portland. So we'll see how he manages here. Um, you know, it's been, you know, a lot of these former players, um, you know, they come in and you don't know how they're going to do. Some of them have fared well. Some of them haven't. So uh, this is just another don't know. We'll see how Chauncey does here in Portland. All right, Parker, let's see how you feel about this one. Uh, I'm going to do Jason Kidd next, and I'm going to put him in C. Now, so far, I think that Jason Kidd's coaching career has been a D. Uh, I put him ahead of Bickerstaff, but I don't think it's been great, obviously. I don't think he's had a strong start to his head coaching career, but I'm putting him in C because I think that this Dallas opportunity is a really good gig for him. Having the an owner... Uh, with the flexibility and with the confidence uh, of Rick Carlisle, I think will help him a lot. Having a player like a Luka Doncic that not only can he use and rely on as a top tier player, but also that he can, as a former you know Hall of Fame point guard, he can mold and grow to a new level. And uh, also, I mean, Dallas is the most talented of any three teams that he's coached, obviously by far. Um, so I think this is going to be Jason Kidd's most successful job, and I don't think that's really a debate. Uh, so I'm going to put him in C because I think uh, that he'll show us a little bit more in Dallas. Yeah, and basing this on his coaching career so far, he hasn't been great, but he hasn't been too bad. Um, you know, he, he's you know, and he was a big part of that finals run for Dallas in 2011. So, like you said, this is the most talented roster he's had by a long shot. How he manages this is going to be, um, you know, really just like like you said, we're on a little C basis with it. So, um, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of guys struggle that first time around. And, you know, this is the ch- second chance for Jason Kidd. So I'm excited to see what he does. I think he'll do better. Uh, but, you know, it, it's just a, you know, we'll see basis. And then uh, we're basing this on what he's done so far. And it hasn't been uh, too much to, you know, brag about. So a C tier for me also. Uh, Derek Rivers and the, uh, or excuse me, Derek Rivers, Doc Rivers and the Philadelphia 76ers. I'm going to put Doc in B tier. I'm going to put him actually behind Tom Thibodeau. Uh, 
obviously I know Doc's a Hall of Fame caliber coach. He's had a lot of success in Boston, in LA, in Philly. Um, He's a great regular season coach. I know there's guys that, you know, love playing for him. I know that he's had a lot of success everywhere he's gone. My big thing with Doc is he's never been able to win the big games. He always comes up short in the playoffs. And that's an issue for me. It's a. It seems like his teams aren't necessarily a hundred percent ready to go in the postseason, and that reflects on coaching. And I can't put him in a tier like I think a lot of people would because of that. And I'm putting him actually behind Tom Thibodeau for that reason because I think with the Bulls and certainly with the Knicks this year, uh, Tom Thibodeau's teams are nece- are hardly ever as talented as Doc Rivers' teams, but they always play with a lot of heart, and it seems like they're always more ready for the postseason than Doc Rivers' teams. Yeah, and, and and it's it's you know it's true. It is. Um, Doc is you know certainly one of the NBA's best. Still, personally, I think. Um, but you know he's he's had you know he you know made the playoffs. You know he's the best team in the Eastern Conference heading in to the playoffs in the regular season was Philadelphia, and you know he had the Sixers in a great spot. Just couldn't you know he just couldn't come through. I, I'm a big Doc Rivers fan. Um, he's going to be in B tier for me also. He just couldn't come through, you know, in the big games. You know, he, he couldn't pull it off this year with Philadelphia, and he was never able to do it in Los Angeles. So we'll see how he fares here in the coming years. Mm-hmm. Um, Eric Spolstra. Uh, Spolstra, I got to put an A tier. I think I'm going to put him ahead of Monty Williams Parker just because I love Monty. But Spolstra's won a pair of rings and has also gotten to the NBA Finals, uh, you know, a couple more times. So I think he's proven it longer. I think Spolster is a top tier guy. I think he's kind of like the uh, Bob Melvin, if you will, of the NBA. I get that he had a couple years of LeBron and Dwayne Wade, and everyone's like, "Oh, he's you know he's riding their coattails to get you know fame and clout," and that's probably true for a little bit. But ever since LeBron left, uh, we've seen the real coaching side of Eric Spolstra, and it's still really really good. The Heat are always competitive. The Heat are always right there in the Eastern Conference. And uh, I think Spolster is a top five coach in the NBA for sure. Yeah, he is. You know, the, you know, the Miami Heat were in the finals last year. Um, and you can, you know, you can make all the excuses you want about the bubble and, you know, the, the, the one spot, you know, in Orlando. But um, there's no doubting that, you know, Spolster has done a fantastic job. Went from the vi- guy in the video room um 15 years ago to now a pair of rings and, uh, you know, a coach of one of the mo- most the NBA's most popular franchises. So um, I'm a big Eric Spolster fan as well. Um, and uh, yeah, he'd be an A tier for me also. Let's get to the reigning champs head coach, Frank Vogel. Parker, I'll let you take the lead on this one. Where are you putting Frank Vogel? I love Frank Vogel. I loved him when he was here in Indiana. Um you know, you know, he had great teams with, you know, Granger and Hansbro and Paul George, of course. Um, and, you know, he's won the NBA Finals. And how much of that is LeBron? How much of that is actual, you know, great coaching from Vogel? I'm going to put Vogel in A tier. I am. Um, he's, he, for me, he's a, you know, he's a great basketball mind and a great coach. He'd be A tier for me. I, I like it. I, I'd, I'd put him in B, but I think it's close. I like Vogel a lot as well. I think he's done a really, really nice job. Uh, with the Lakers, I think that uh, he kind of was unfairly criticized after his tenure in Indiana came to an end. Uh, so I don't disagree with you in the sense that I think that he's a lot better coach than a lot of people give him credit for. Um, let's talk about Rick Carlisle, the newest coach of the Pacers. And I didn't mean to let you take the reins on two in a row, uh, but uh, obviously you got to take the reins on Rick Carlisle. Where are you putting Coach Carlisle? So for Coach Carlisle, base if we're basing this on his career, he's got to be A tier, maybe S tier. He's you know one of the greatest coaches uh, in uh, you know in recent memory. Um, he's going to be an A tier for me, um, and, and and we'll see how he fares in Indiana um, because you know there's no excuses now for the players. Um, you know you know you could blame the coach all you want. They blamed McMillan. They blamed Bjorkren. Um, but you know, you, you can't blame Carlisle because he's been, you know, arguably one of the best coaches of the last 15 years, along with Popovich, as well as, um, you know, guys like Spolstra and, um, you know, Doc Rivers. So, um, they're, they're, they're certainly very talented, uh, coaches that he's had to, you know, um, go up against and, you know, he's won an NBA finals. Uh, now he came from the Larry Bird coaching, uh, tree. 
Uh, so I'm excited to see what he does in Indianapolis. Uh, he's eight tier for me. I, I, I agree. I think Coach Carlisle is an absolute stud, and I'm excited to see what he accomplishes in Indiana. Steve Kerr with the Golden State Warriors. Steve Kerr obviously has, you know, uh, three rings in his time as Warriors head coach. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of success there. But again, this is another case of how much of it's the talent on his team. So for that case, or for that reason, I'm going to put him right ahead of Steve Nash because he has done a little bit more uh, in his coaching career just because he's been a coach for a little longer. Uh, but I think Steve Kerr is solidly in beats here for me. Yeah, he's in beats here for me also. Um, I love the passion that he brings. You know, he was a great analyst when he was, you know, before he was a head coach and in, uh, in, in there in the Bay Area. Um, you know, he's won finals, um, but he's he's had great teams, you know, um, and that we, we've seen the Warriors struggle when they were without their best players. So, um, you know, it's really hard to tell how great of a coach he is based on how we, what we've seen from um, the Warriors when guys like Curry and Thompson and Dr- Draymond Green aren't healthy. And it hasn't been overwhelmingly great. So he's in B tier for me. I put him ahead of like guys, guys like Nash. Um, and, uh, but you know, Doc Rivers and Thibodeau are more proven and they've won more games, um, w- with less. So he's going to be in that, you know, a very similar spot for me. Uh, let's get to another guy that I'm really, really excited to hear your thoughts on Parker. And that's going to be, uh, I-, I know another guy that you really, really like, um, Quinn Snyder, where are you putting coach Snyder? I love Quinn Snyder. Um, he, you know, he's, he's, um, another guy who's a great basketball mind, I'm going to put him in B tier. Uh, I'll probably put him ahead between Rivers and Kerr. Um, he, uh, for me, he's, um, you know, had great teams in Utah. Um, and, and you know, he's developed guys, well, guys like Donovan Mitchell, um, as well as, um, you know, Rudy Gobert. You know, so he's had talent there and he's proven he can win. He's a solid coach, a solid B tier coach for me. Um, Tyron Liu. Uh, Tyron Liu for me is an interesting case because I was going to put him in C tier uh, at the top of C tier, just because I don't think he's made a lot of great in-game adjustments, in-game decisions in his time as a head coach. I thought he was kind of, you know, LeBron's puppet. Uh, But what he's been able to do with the Clippers, especially since the Kawhi uh, injury in these playoffs and have them playing with the heart that they're playing with and have them play with the intensity that they're playing with, I think he's earned himself up into B tier. And I'm actually going to put him right in between Nash and Kerr. Kerr has one more ring. And that's the difference. Uh, but I really like what I've seen from Ty Lue in this postseason. He's actually impressed me. Uh, and he's starting He's starting to make me believe that he can actually be a good NBA head coach. Yeah, me too. He's, you know, he surprised the heck out of me. Um, you know, he he was, you know, a bit shaky in Cleveland. Um, you know, he was, you know, one of the favorites for the Lakers job last offseason or, you know, two years ago, whatever it was. Um, but he, anyways, but he's been, been fantastic with the Clippers. Um and, and he's he's proven that he can you know he can coach his you know he could coach his tail off so um, he's going to be in B tier for me also um, he I'd probably uh, put him ahead of ahead of Nash as well um, and and I'm also ahead of Kerr based on what we've done this year but Kerr's you know he's done it longer and he's proven you know he's a proven winner so um, I like Ty Lue a lot he's B tier for me. All right, let's do one there. I I kind of forgot he was coaching here, Parker. Billy Donovan with the Chicago Bulls. Uh, he's had some time at Florida. He had some time with the OKC Thunder. Where are you thinking about putting Billy Donovan? Billy Donovan's interesting to me. Um, he he had he had some great teams in OKC. Um, you know, he was in Florida as well. Um, but he hasn't won a whole lot. Um, I'd probably put him in B tier um, ahead of Nash, but behind Lou. I just need to see more winning from him. Um, and the Bulls are, you know, they're a bit, bit shaky right now. But if he can get the Bulls in shape, he, you know, he certainly moves up that list. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, let's do next. Um, I'm thinking about Nick Nurse in the Chicago, in the Toronto Raptors. I don't think you're going to agree with this me on this one. I still think Nick Nurse is a top-tier coach. I know the Raptors weren't very good this year. Um I think they just got decimated by injuries. I, I I don't know how much blame I can put on Nick Nurse, but the fact that you're winning uh, championships uh, or competing for championships with guys like uh, you know past his prime Kyle Lowry and um, Gary Trent Jr., Pascal Siakam, um, Serge Ibaka. Well, Serge Ibaka is not there anymore. I'm sorry, uh, um, but you know uh, just a lot of guys that aren't supposed to 
make a good team that Nick Nurse has been able to make a good team. So I'm going to put him in A above Frank Vogel. Um, I still think he has a lot to prove, and I think the Raptors will be right back to competing next season. Yeah, I'm going to put him in B tier. I'd put him ahead of, you know, Thibodeau, right at the top of B tier. Um, if we had an A minus tier, I'd put him in that. But, um, you know, he, he won, you know, he's won a finals, you know, with Kawhi Leonard and, uh, you know, Lowry and, you know, among others. Um, but, you know, you know, he had a bit of a down year. Um, so we'll see if he can come back next year and, you know, uh, get more out of his team. But, you know, he's going to be at the top of B tier for me. Steven Silas in the Houston Rockets. This is another guy that um, I need to see a little bit more of. I know he's had a little bit under his belt, um, you know, with the Rockets this year. They weren't very good, but I'm not going to hold too much against him uh, when John Wall was hurt and, you know, James Harden wanted out. It was just kind of a messy situation. Uh, Steven Silas, I think, has a lot of potential. I know Damian Lillard said he wants to play for him. Um, We'll see how much that comes to be true. Um, But... Uh, for me, it's still I gotta wait and see more with Steven Silas and the Houston Rockets. Yeah, I do too. Um, the the Rockets were um, really just you know a confusing case last year when they lost Mike D'Antoni. Um, I, I'm and I really didn't know what to expect. They lose Harden, they lose a few guys, but they still have um, you know you know they have pieces there to be you know they're pretty good. Um, I just need to see more from them. Um, Chris Finch in the Minnesota Timberwolves, he has not been the coach for very long. He replaced Ryan Saunders. Um, but I think I'm going to throw him smack dab in C tier with Jason Kidd. I mean, he's had moments where, you know, D'Lo and Carl Anthony Towns and, uh, they look, they look like a team that's kind of on the rise in the West and could maybe compete for a playoff spot. And then there's also stretches where they look like one of the worst teams in the NBA. So, uh, I think consistency holds back Finch from being, uh, you know, put anywhere higher or lower on this list. Uh, but I'll put him in C tier for now. I've seen, you know, glimpses where I think he could be a B tier coach, but I've also seen glimpses where I think he could be a D tier coach. So I'll put him in C and we'll adjust as the year goes on. I'm going to put him in the don't know column. Okay. I'm, I, I need to see more from him. Uh, like you said, they, they, he's had moments to where he's gotten some pretty good moments out of players like, uh, you know, KAT and, and D'Lo, but, you know, I just need to see more from him. For sure. And I, I'll tell you what, I don't know how many people watching on YouTube see what we see, but he just looks like, you know, um, Chandler from Friends 20 years after the show. <laughs> <laughs> he does. He does for sure. All right, let's move on to another guy that I, I like a lot, and I'm curious where you think you're going to put him. Uh, Michael Malone in the Denver Nuggets. I think Mike Malone has done a fantastic job with the Nuggets. I'm going to put him in B tier. Um, you know, you know, right? I'm going to put him in between Kerr and Ty Lue. Uh, I will um, because, you know, you know, he's had very deep teams, and he's managed these teams very well. They've been in the playoffs, you know, the last few years. And I think Mike Malone has done a fantastic job. He's B tier for me. I, I tend to agree with you. I think that uh, he's done a really nice job, like you said. Um, I think that um, his, you know, the Nuggets are always a deep team that always competes. Uh, they've come up short in the postseason, which is what's keeping him out of A tier. Uh, but um, I definitely think Michael Mullen's been, you know, uh, one of the better uh, Nuggets coaches of, you know, the past couple decades. So um he's doing good things and uh if he can find a way to get to the western conference finals or better yet the nba finals i wouldn't be surprised at all if we end up putting michael mullen in a tier down the road yeah you know i i would completely agree with you there all right well we got seven more to do here today uh let's do you know the former pacers head coach nate mcmillan who's in the eastern conference finals uh, with the atlanta hawks i'm gonna put mcmillan in b tier i think he's earned it um Hmm. Now, see, this is tough for me, Parker, because I want to put him right here because I think he's a better coach than Ty Lue, but I'm going to put him here uh, because I have to respect the fact that Ty Lue has a ring. And maybe he didn't earn that ring, but I do have to respect the fact that he's been the head coach of a team that won a championship. So I love Nate McMillan. Uh, he's done such a good job with the Hawks. I am 99% sure that they're going to keep him on as their full-time head coach moving forward. Uh, but what a job he's done this year, um, really putting his head coaching career back on the map. Yeah, he has. 
And, um, you know, he, he was, you know, a consistent winner in Indy. He just couldn't get over that hump of, you know, the first round of the playoffs. He had good teams, and, uh, you know, he has a really good team right now in the Atlanta Hawks. And we've said it time and time again, he should get this head job after this year. Um, so, you know, I, I'm a big Nate McMillan fan, and uh, he deserves to be in this spot. He does. Uh, let's do Luke Walton, Parker. Where would you put Luke Walton? Luke Walton's interesting to me because he didn't have a great, you know, great tenure with the Lakers. Um, but you know, he's he, you know, he's been the head coach of the, you know, and it was the Kings this year. Um, and, and you know, the Kings haven't had a great history of being uh, great, but um, I still think he's a solid coach. He's going to be C tier for me. Okay, I agree with you. I was going to put him in C tier as well. Uh, I think Luke Walton, you know, has had moments where I think that he has a potential future as an NBA head coach. Uh, but like you said, he's been coached. He's never really coached a team that's been a, a, a contender. He's always coached teams that have been rebuilding or tearing it down. He's never really, I've never seen him at the helm of a team that's trying to win. So I can't put him any higher than C tier for now. Uh, Dwayne Casey, former coach of the year. Um He's now in Detroit after you know being let go by Toronto because he has that coach of the year and because he'd had a really couple really solid years in Toronto. I'm going to put him at the end of B, uh, but I just I don't think that he's on the same level as a lot of these other guys in B right now. I think his best days as a coach are behind him, uh, and uh, really that coach of the year award's the only thing keeping him out of the top of C. Yeah, and uh, you know he had great teams in Toronto. He did, uh, but the Pistons are. Um, you know, that they haven't been had, you know, they haven't had a whole lot of successful years recently. Um, so, you know, I respect the fact that Dwayne Casey's, you know, uh, a proven head coach and a proven winner in this league. So he's going to be a B tier for me as well. Um, uh, he just, you know, he, he's proven he can win and that's why he deserves a spot in B tier. No doubt about it. And, uh, so we have four coaches left to go. Like I said, uh, let's knock out Taylor Jenkins and the Memphis Grizzlies. I like Taylor Jenkins a lot. I know. He hasn't been there very long, but what he's been able to do with a team that's very young, uh, talented, of course, but a team that's very young, they've had to kind of learn on the fly. I think he's done a really nice job, and I'm going to put him in B tier, and I'm going to put him, I think, right ahead of Billy Donovan. Uh, uh, I know Billy Donovan has been at it for a little bit longer, but I don't know if I ever was as impressed uh, with a Billy Donovan team than I was with this year's Memphis Grizzlies team. I think that Taylor Jenkins is definitely one of uh, my favorite young coaches in the NBA. And uh, I think he's doing a really good job with the Memphis Grizzlies. Yeah, he is. And, uh, you know, he's, he's um, been, you know, we, we, I didn't know what to expect. I really didn't, but he's managed this Memphis Grizzlies team very well. Um, you know, they, they made the playing tournament this year. Um, so I'm excited to see what Taylor Jenkins and the Memphis Grizzlies do in years ahead. Yeah, no doubt about it. All right. Let's see if I can announce or, you know, pronounce these last couple names, right. Um, because I've been waiting to, you know, see, uh, how long I could push it off. Uh, but, uh, our first one that we still have to do, uh, is Charlotte Hornets head coach, uh, James Borrego. Uh, so where would you put coach Borrego with the Charlotte Hornets? You know, he had a lot of new faces in Charlotte this year. He did. And I think he performed very well. I just need to see more from him. I'm going to put him in C tier. Um, because, you know, the, the Hornets ha didn't have, you know, a pushover year by any means. Um, I just need to see a little bit more from him. He's C-tier for me. I, I agree. I think that he has the talent in Miles Bridges and uh, LaMelo Ball and, you know, Malik Monk. I mean, uh, P.J. Washington, the talent's there to build this team up. Uh, but as of right now, I mean, there's still a lot of work to be done. And for that, I think he's been average so far in his tenure. Um, so two more coaches left to go now. Um, let's start off with... Uh, the Thunder's new guy, and I'm going to butcher this name, Parker, but uh, we'll give it a shot. And that's, uh, you know, Mark uh, Dejnault. I, I, I don't know if I, I, I think I screwed that up royally, but he's the new guy at the helm of the Thunder. And I think we're just going to drag him to don't know. I think that, uh, I've, I mean, I'm not going to lie to you, Parker. I feel like I keep up pretty well in the, uh, you know, the topics and the discussion of modern sports. I hadn't heard of this guy until tonight. Yeah, I hadn't either, to be honest with you. Um, and it's going to be a don't know for me also, uh, because you know, you know, I think he's the youngest NBA coach at 35 years old. So, 
Um, I just need to see more from him. I do. And our final coach of this um, tier list today uh, is going to be the Milwaukee Bucks head coach, Mike Budenholzer. I like Coach Bud a lot. I know he's never really gotten the, the big wins in the playoffs, but I think he always does a lot better with uh, some teams that don't, des- you know, that shouldn't be as good as they are. I think he always, he has one of the best defensive teams in the league. He has, I believe, two NBA Coach of the Year awards. Uh, he's just done a really, really nice job in both Atlanta and Milwaukee. Uh, so for me, just because he's proven a little bit more than some of these other guys, I'm going to put him in A tier, but I'm going to put him above Monty. I think Coach Bud's done a really, really nice job. Yeah, he has. And um, if he can get over the hump and make the finals this year, he's certainly in this, you know, in this A tier list. Um, if Monty, you know, advances and, and Bud doesn't, I'd put Monty ahead of him. So it's it's really a contingent on who makes it to the finals. And if they don't, if they, if neither of them makes it, you know, they're, they're in the same spot they are now for me. And if they both make it, it's whoever wins, you know? So right. exactly. We'll, see. we'll absolutely see. But that does it for today's tier list. Um, we survived. I was a little worried when we put it together. I was like, oh boy, I don't know NBA head coaches as well as I know some of the other stuff we talked about. So I was a little worried that I'd sound like an idiot. But other than trying to pronounce our friend Mark's name with the thunder, uh, I think I did okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think you did. This is a fun one. I always love doing, uh, you know, coaches for any of these leagues. And then we're going to do an NFL tier list coming up here in the next few shows. But um, you know, the the first one we did was MLB managers, and that was a blast. And this one was just as fun. Yeah, it sure was. Um, but we're about you know six minutes or so over the two hour mark. But we had a lot of fun with you today. Again, if you're just now joining us, Penny Hardaway, a serious contender to be the next head coach of the Magic. Um, we went over some of the uh, biggest moves of the MLB offseason and kind of regraded them about two months into the year, uh, almost three months into the year. And then uh, the Bucks beat the Hawks. Trey Young sprains his ankle tonight. Is that going to be the death of Atlanta? And then we just did a tier list of the best NBA head coaches. So before we put a bow on this show, Parker, any final thoughts? You know, there was uh, you know, lots of baseball going on this this weekend, um, and, and this uh, this big um, you know sticky substance thing is is you know really hitting this MLB hard. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and uh, personally, I, I think that you know MLB was trying to work on pace of play, but I think this has honestly made it worse. I have, mm-hmm. um, and, and you know, we saw uh, Hector Santiago get ejected this afternoon in, in, in Seattle um, with his glove. Um, and we saw Girardi and uh, Max Scherzer get into it, which ultimately led uh, Girardi to get ejected. But he was checked three times in four innings, which is completely unacceptable. Yeah, and no doubt yeah. about it. Uh, it's it's going to be. Uh, and shout out to Patrick, by the way, our engineer, for uh, you know letting us know about that Girardi Scherzer debacle. So um, it's always good to have you know the other members of the staff helping us write the show. So. Appreciate and even, it. And, and even a guy like Patrick, who, you know, he's, you know, he gives us ideas when he can. But, you know, I remember early on this summer, he'd come, he'd pop in during live, when we're live on air and give us live updates. So mm-hmm. um, we appreciate Pat as always. No doubt about it. And I mean, he's going to he's going to have to hold down the fort this week because, I mean, I'm gone. So he's in charge. So. We'll he's see how that goes. He's, he's got it. He's got it. He's smart. He'll figure it out. I'll get a three-page email from him on Tuesday. Norm- normally, it's the other way around. When he's gone, we don't know what to do. Facts. No, we'll be fine. If we can survive while he's gone, you can survive while I'm gone. So Right. Um, but, no, we appreciate you hanging out with us here today. Um, I'm live in Fort Myers. If you're just now joining us, I'll be here all week this week. I come back on Saturday. So, uh but starting next Monday, I'll be back in, you know, the DYT, but taking a week to uh, work on my golf game, get some sun and uh, get away from WWSU for a bit. I love what I do, but uh, I've been working almost 50 hours a week all summer. And uh, I think it's going to be good for me to kind of decompress a little bit. Yeah, it's much needed for you, I bet. Yeah, no doubt about it. So we're going to step away, uh, call it a day, uh, I should say. Uh, and we'll see you again tomorrow from one to three and YouTube only all week this week. Uh, but you can still catch everything on YouTube from one to three, right? Just search WWSU 1069. Follow us on social media at WWSU 1069. That's on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. 
we get some brand new business cards in the work parker they look great uh, we're actually going to put the order we're actually going to put the order in on them tomorrow and hopefully they get here for the next orientation event so i'm really excited to start passing those out as well yeah i'm i'm really excited yeah I, you know they, they, they I, you know i saw that you sent me what they looked like and uh they look really good so i'm excited to start handing those out and uh we're just getting more and more ready for the fall and we're really excited no doubt about it. So again, follow us on social media there at WWSU 1069. Follow us on our personals as well at Parker Testa at ESPN Shea Neal. Uh, and until tomorrow uh, for Parker Testa back in Noblesville and me in Fort Myers, I'm saying so long and keep it real. We'll see you tomorrow.